Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of how the human soul functions. The interview was held on the 9th of April 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session two. Well, welcome to our second session about the discussion about the human soul and answering questions about the human soul. But before we answer any more questions about the human soul, we really want to go over our first session because we feel there's quite a number of, uh, quite a lot of information that we need to add to the first session as a, as a general discussion and general questions. And then uh, after that, after this session, we might be able to get into answering some specific questions about the human soul and questions that people have sent in about the human soul. But, but hopefully this discussion is like an addendum to session one. So what we recommend everybody does with this session is that they firstly watch session one which is in uh, five, or I think it's in seven or eight parts, and, and then come to this particular session, which, are, which we will classify as discussion and questions about session one. Yeah. <laughs> and the topic of session one was how the human soul functions. Yes. So we're going to be going through those principles again today with perhaps some other details and some more questions. Yes. So that's our primary purpose today. So hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation today. And we, myself and Mary are going to have some interaction during this uh, discussion about the human soul and how it functions. And we hope that uh, in the process of that discussion, it becomes clearer about the points that we raised in our first session. Okay. G'day. So, to start off, I thought you actually prepared some notes about how the human soul functions. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you had a discussion with Luli in the last session which was great, and I had a look over that this morning. But I thought some of the notes that you've written here are really informative, and perhaps if we could even just go through those notes paragraph by paragraph and just discuss some of the points that perhaps weren't covered in that first session. Um, I would love to do that with you. Sounds, sounds good. So are you happy to start? Uh, sure. I'll yeah. read the first paragraph. Yep. God made a foolproof system with the soul. God did not design the same system for the mind. This is because the mind is a part of the physiological functions of the soul rather than being the soul itself. The mind is an attribute of the soul. The soul has many other attributes and characteristics, some of which are far more important to develop than the mind and some of which are far more powerful in determining the divine truth than the mind has the capacity to absorb. The soul eventually contains the mind but has many more attributes than just the mind. So to me, there's a lot in that paragraph. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but perhaps we could start with the very first sentence. I wanted to ask you, you said there, God made a foolproof system with the soul. Mm. What do you mean by that? Like, what are we, what are, what's it foolproof against? <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost uh, suggesting that anyone who has a soul is a bit of a fool. <laughs> 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 Potentially a bit of a fool, but that's not the case. But yeah, the, the, when I say God made a foolproof system, it's really clever the way God designed the entire universe. The way God designed the universe was God first designed all of the laws that govern the universe. Mm -hmm. So before the universe actually came into being, into existence, the laws were already established. Now the majority of these laws and the most powerful of these laws are governing the human soul. So that means that God, before God created the universe, knew that God was going to create the human soul. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the human soul has been, uh, the universe has been created for the human soul to exist. So it's like the human soul's playground. Uh -huh. All right. so, so we first need to understand that God made this big uh, set of laws that govern the potential existence of the human soul. Then God created the human soul uh -huh. and the, then God created the universe in which the human soul could, be, could use as a playground. Right, so what you're saying is God, really, God did all of this for the human soul. Correct. God created the framework or the laws that would govern the experience of the soul. Is that what you mean? 
and not only the experience of the soul, but govern the very operation of the universe in which the soul lived uh -huh. and the interaction between the universe and the soul itself. Yes. So, so God created a whole series of very complex laws in order to do that. Now, this means that God made a, the entire system foolproof. In other words, we can't make mistakes with the human soul. We can, uh, that, that are unable to be corrected, I mean. Uh -huh. We can make mistakes, certainly, yeah. that, that, that need correction, but we can't actually make mistakes where the human soul somehow destroys the universe. Right. And we can't make mistakes where the human soul is not governed by law still. So, in other words, the human soul is always governed by law, and we can't avoid that. We, mm -hmm. we can't get away from that. Mm -hmm. And the laws are all is previously established before the universe even came into existence. And what that means then is that the, that the soul itself is this integrated system that God created that interacts with the universe and particularly interacts with the laws of the universe because there are some parts of the universe that only get created when the soul interacts in the, within, within the law framework in a certain way. Yeah. That means then that it's impossible to break the human soul. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's impossible to, to cause so much damage to the human soul that it's irreparable. Mm -hmm. right? And in that regard, God made a foolproof system. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much we are fools yep. <laughs> <laughs> and how much we desire to break the laws and desire to get away from the framework. In the end, the human soul is an unbreakable piece of machinery that God has made that nothing can destroy nothing as as far as it's known can destroy aside from god herself mm -hmm. also while the human body can be destroyed and go into different elements and while the spirit body theoretically can do the same thing it, it is highly unlikely that that can happen to the human soul and when i say highly unlikely we don't know because it's never happened mm -hmm. but but at this stage it's, there's no record of any single human soul ever being destroyed or being dis put back into the, its elemental parts. Yeah. Because of that, you could say that God created a foolproof human soul, uh -huh. a, a soul that is unable to be destroyed, a soul that no matter what mistakes we make, we're unable to fully decompose the soul itself. In other words, the soul will always retain its existence after its creation. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so you said a few things there yep. that I would like to ask more about. You said that um, basically the soul can't ever be destroyed. Even if we want to destroy it, yep. uh, we, it can't happen. Yep. But then you, you described what sounded... As far as it, we know. As far as we know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> who, yes. Who knows that at some point in the future God may have a process for human souls that haven't received divine love? I don't know, but at this point in time, there has been no single human soul that's ever been destroyed into its elemental parts. Mm -hmm. In other words, the human soul, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how self-destructive it becomes, and no matter how much of intention it has to act out of harmony with love, still can't get destroyed. So, so in that regard, it's foolproof. <laughs> and in fact, it almost seems to be the other way around, doesn't it? No matter what we do, the universe and the laws that we interact with seem to push us towards growth, don't they? Well, they push us towards correction. Yeah. And so, so the reality is the way God just created this universe is that every framework, if you like, the universal framework, which are laws, which we mm -hmm. classify as laws, that govern the human soul and govern the universe itself and the interaction between the soul and the universe, which is a very important factor, these laws are unable to be broken and therefore they are always in operation and they impose themselves upon the human soul. So no matter how far the human soul gets out of harmony with those laws, the laws are attempting to correct the human soul back into harmony. Yeah. And this is the beautiful system that God made. It's, a, it's such a foolproof system. It doesn't matter how much we take the human soul out of harmony through the exercise of our will. The, the law framework that involve, that the, in which we live, the mm -hmm. of the universe in which we live, is pulling us or attempting to pull us back into harmony. Yeah. And so it's a self-correcting system. And eventually, given enough time, every single individual in the universe will be pulled back into harmony with the universal laws. Yeah. So 
for, so from what you said earlier and what you said now, it sounds like the soul operates within a system, mm -hmm. which is the universe and the universal laws that well, God Well, the soul has. operates within the universal laws, yep. and the universe and the soul are basically the subsequent result of those universal laws. Yeah, yep. okay. So that and the soul is the most complicated of all of God's creations, the human soul is the most complicated. So it's far more complex than the human body. It's far more complex than the spirit body. It's far more complex than the universe itself, actually. Yeah, soul. so this is where I want to ask you, because in your introduction there, you said that you basically described to me, it sounded like two systems. One is the system of God's universe in operation of which the soul is a part of. And then you describe the soul as a system itself. Well, it's even more than that because, mm -hmm. because there are parts of the universe that are yet to be created, that the soul has the potential to create through the governing systems of the laws. So really, the two systems are the laws that govern the interaction between the soul and the universe, and then the, soul, the, the universe itself, of which the soul is a part. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yes. But the soul has the ability to create new universes as it proceeds. Yes. So if we classify not only all of the universes that have been created at this point, but all of the universes that are potentially able to be created, mm -hmm. given the governing of the laws, then we're, we're saying that the soul is more complicated and complex than all of those things. Yes. Because it has the ability to actually seed or create those things. Uh-huh. So, but there are those two factors, the factor of the soul itself and the universe of that, that, that has been created in which the soul plays yep. are all governed by universal laws that God established prior to the creation of both the universe and the soul. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And so I suppose I was um, asking about... You, in your statement, you said there's a foolproof system with the soul, and what from what you've just said, you, uh, it sounds like there's a foolproof system that universally. happens universally <laughs> Correct. that the soul operates in and impacts upon through the creation of new dimensions and things like that. Yes. And then today we're going to talk more about how the human soul functions, and you could almost call that a system, or a, it's a way in which the human soul operates. Yes. And is that so this universal and thing that you just... there are all laws just... that determine its operation. These are all laws, that principles that determine the soul's operation. Mm, okay. Yeah. 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 So everything that God has designed has laws that govern its operation. Right yeah. the way through from the soul, the most complex creation of God, right the way through to the other lesser complex creations of God, right down to the individual elements. They are all, and even right down to individual subatomic particles, they all are created uh, and, and governed by the laws that surround them. So, so none of them can operate outside of a law. Mm -hmm. of, of, mm -hmm. So that none of them operate outside of the laws that God has established. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And mankind has yet to discover most of those laws. Mm. Like we think we've discovered most of them, but actually we've yet to discover a minute particle of those laws that fully govern the entire system of the soul and the universe in which it lives. Mm. Yeah. So the full free system is what? The... The universe in which it lives or the soul itself? Both. Yeah. Both are foolproof systems. Yeah. Everything God creates is a foolproof system. And we are arrogant when we say that God made a mistake because God does not make mistakes when it comes to any system that God creates. Yeah. And God created the soul and therefore God did not make a mistake with the soul. And, and any appearance of mistake is actually the exercise of our will in a direction that's out of harmony with the, the law. Yeah. And then, then these mistakes appear, mm -hmm. and they, but they are of our own creation, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not the creation of God. But from your statement, it's foolproof, and you were saying that, yes. that it's foolproof in terms of destruction. You can't destroy the universe, you can't destroy the soul. It's as even far foolproof as it's with regard to when we create outside or attempt to create outside of the law. The law is still imposed, and as a result, there is a correction. Uh -huh. And there is a painful experience that the soul experiences. And all of that happens as a result of us attempting to operate outside the law. It's impossible to operate outside of the law. We need to give up that as a concept. Yeah. And any pain that the human soul individually or collectively experiences is the result of the individual or the collective um, 
taking actions that are out of harmony with the the laws that are that are fixed and immovable. Yep. And and nothing can change those laws yep. aside from God. And so this is the other aspect of how it's foolproof. Correct. We can't wreck the laws, we can't break the laws, we can't break our soul. We, we can't, can't manipulate the yep. law, we can't yep. uh, manoeuvre around the laws, yep. just like you can here on earth, you can manoeuvre around a bit, uh, manoeuvre around the laws, but you can't do that. You can't, you can't break the soul in any physical sense or emotional sense mm-hmm. or spiritual sense, mm-hmm. actually. And, and, and any concept that you can is based on an imaginary concept that humans have created living out of harmony with the laws of themselves. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's just a remarkable system. And the more time you spend investigating the human soul, the more remarkable it appears. Because mm. it sounds like you're saying not only is it a foolproof system, you can't buck the system, you can't override the system. So then presumably everything we're going to talk about today, which is really the system or how the soul functions, yeah. the system of the soul, if we can call that, yeah. these things are removable from what you've just said. Yes. But, yeah. but given what you said about the laws, presumably they're all there because they're expedient and work well. Well, they're all there too because they're all loving. So uh-huh. all of God's laws are loving. So, so that means that every single law that God's ever created for the complete operation of the universe and the operation of the human soul are always loving. So all of these principles we are going to discuss are also loving. It doesn't mean that, that we're, we're going to discuss exhaustive principles because obviously we're in a process, the humanity is in a process of discovering the soul more and more and more. And, and obviously as we discover more things about the soul, there's a likelihood that we'll discover more laws that govern the operation of the soul and therefore we can't just say these are all the all and only laws that govern the operation of the soul. Yeah. But they are the laws that the laws that we're going to discuss more fully today are actually little known on the earth. You know, very few people on the earth, if any, actually really know these laws uh, or understand the, the principle of the operation of these laws. And, and it's only in the spirit world, in the, la- in the higher spheres and dimensions that most people have come to know the operation of these particular laws to a degree. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it's to a complete degree. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So <coughs> if we continue then, um, because that first, I mean, we just discussed the first sentence. There's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you sort of went on to say that the mind is quite separate from this system of the soul. And, and perhaps if you... Um, well, yeah, I wouldn't call it separate. I would call it an attribute of the soul. The soul is a very, very complex organism uh, which has, as we've discussed, multitudes of laws which which operate upon it and govern it, its operation physically, emotionally and spiritually. And um, the mind is just an attribute or an organ of the soul. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like in your body right now, you could say you've got a liver, your kidneys, you've got pancreas, you've got gallbladder, you've got all these other organs. And then one of the organs is your brain. Yeah. Well, it's a very similar analogy with the soul. One of the organs of the soul is, you, you could think of it as the brain of the soul, which yeah. is what we classify as the mind. And this is not what most people think of as the mind, yeah. because most people don't, are not aware of the soul at all. And so what they see as the mind, if they're even partially developed, they think the mind is the brain. Yeah. And then if they're a bit more spiritually aware, they think the mind is the mind of the spirit body. Mm-hmm. And none of those things are the mind. Mm-hmm. The real mind of the soul is an organ of the soul and would exist without the spirit body or the physical body existing. Yeah. And, and, it's, and that mind is a subset, if you like, of the soul itself. The soul has far more powerful organs than its own mind and is able to express itself far more powerfully through the expression of other attributes of the soul than its own mind. Mm. Mm. And I know that's something you discussed at length with Luli, so I don't yeah. want to rehash or go over that. Sure. But I suppose um, some of the questions I was thinking about are um, some of the implications of mind dominance on the planet and so on. But perhaps yep. sh- I should ask you to read the following paragraphs and we might get to that, okay. that point. So, yeah. um, for example, and this is one example of the soul having many more attributes than just Mm -hmm. the mind. For example, humility is a far more important attribute to develop than developing the intellect. The reason for this is that if a person is not humble on any single subject, then their mind is not capable of absorbing any new truth about the same subject. 
the mind that is not driven by humility that exists in the soul is always in opposition or disagreement with what is often logically obvious to a humble person. Mm -hmm. In addition, without humility in the soul, the mind will be driven to defend its own position, even when that position is obviously out of harmony with love, logic and truth. Yeah. So what I'm basically saying there is that the human soul uh, attribute of humility is far more important to develop mm -hmm. than the attribute of the intellect. Because without humility, the intellect can't actually be developed at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in other words, humility must come before developing the internet in a certain endeavour. So unless you're, for, so for example, let's say you wanted to pick up a musical instrument. Unless you're humble to the fact that you don't know how to play it at the start and that you need to go to somebody who will teach you or read a book who will teach you or at least learn using some method, usually it comes from some other source other than, the, and, than yourself and you're humble enough to actually go through that process, then it's highly unlikely you'll be able to learn very much with regard to that musical instrument. Now, of course, um, many people who are prodigies are actually humble with spirit interaction and so a spirit teaches them everything they need to know but it's the same process, mm -hmm. it's still the same process. Somebody had to be humble enough to absorb that information and therefore act upon it before they could actually learn the information itself yeah. and take the actions needed to learn how to play a musical instrument. And the same applies to every single form of endeavour that you could ever think of. Mm. Yeah. And what I find fascinating about that is the fact that we do live in a world today which lords the mind and the development of the mind and those who are very intellectually clever. Yeah. And yet, um, we don't, when we neglect other really attributes. important attributes of our soul, yep. we actually stunt the growth of, of our mind. Our, of our mind. <laughs> and so we can also set ourselves up for a lot of disappointment by trying to use our mind hmm. um, and to grow and learn when we haven't developed other qualities yes. that would make that process a lot easier and actually ensure our success. Correct. Yeah. 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 So it's a very important factor about understanding that the soul has these other attributes, not just the intellect or, or the mind part of the soul, but the soul has other attributes which are far more logical to develop first, actually, yeah. than the mind itself is to develop. Yes. Yeah. And what I feel is happening a lot on earth today is that most people will focus on the development of their intellect and do not focus on the development of these far more important aspects of the soul. And as a result, the intellect is severely disabled. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. And this is why how we come up with disabled thinking, like yeah. the whole thinking that if we if you attack me, then that gives me the right to attack you is disabled thinking. Yeah. If if we were connected with our soul, and we connected to love and humility, we w we would go, wow, that's a pretty illogical thing. Is if I attack you, you know, I hit you in the face or something, and you decide you're going to get out a knife and attack me, and sooner or later one of us is going to escalate this attack right the way through to our death, and it was pretty pointless process after that. Yeah. And and this obviously is very illogical. Yeah. Oh, obviously very illogical, and yet we, and there are many people on earth today who would who would swear with all of their might, including die, yeah. for their right to, you know, attack another person for what they've done to them. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that obviously is out of harmony with true logic, mm -hmm. but, but many people think it's logical. Yeah. And that's because the, uh, there are other aspects of their soul other than their intellect that are, that, that are, that are severely lacking in development. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So do you want me to read yeah, the you next continue. one? Yep. Another example is love. Love is a far more important attribute to develop than developing the intellect. The mind is also not capable of experiencing the feelings of love. The mind is totally incapable of understanding some of the workings of the universe without the soul understanding love. Both natural love coming from within the human and divine love coming from God's soul. It matters not how much is discussed with such a mind. The soul attached to the mind will not have the capacity to understand the truth about how the universe actually works without the soul receiving divine love from God. The mind will not have the capacity to understand natural love without the soul having developed its own natural love to some degree. Mm. Yeah, so this is another example of how you know, there are attributes in, in the soul that are far more important to develop 
than the intellect itself. And in fact, what happens and what, what we've found happens through our own experience is that the more humble you are and the more loving you become, the more you understand. Mm. So interestingly, if you develop some aspects of the soul other than the intellect, the intellect automatically is developed as a byproduct yeah. of the development in these other areas. And this is because the soul itself is dominant over the intellect, over the mind. Yeah. yeah. And, and some, some qualities of the soul or some aspects of the soul, such as humility and love, when we develop those, it actually improves the function of many of the other aspects of the soul. Correct. Whereas we Including can, the mind. Including the mind, yeah. yeah. Whereas if we focus on the mind, we can focus, focus, focus and try. But as you've just said, if, unless we're working on these other things, it's limited. Yes. Whereas if we focus on humility and love, as we grow them, it doesn't, we're not limiting any other part. In fact, we're enabling Correct. The other functions of the soul. And not only are we enabling them, we're enabling them to grow more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we have a stronger ability intellectually to absorb new information even yep. once we develop other aspects of the soul. What, what I notice quite strongly in, in particular is that if a person is not humble or does not have love, it is very, very difficult for them to intellectually understand some concepts yep. and it's very, very difficult for them to display logic in most of their life. Yeah. And this is because the, of the effect of the soul's development in other areas other than the intellect and how it has an impact upon the intellect. Mm -hmm. The intellect, if you like, is the, the, um, what you would classify as the effect of the causal change that occurs within the soul in other areas. Yeah. So yeah. A, a person's intellect improves in its function once other areas of the soul improve in their function. Yeah. Mm. And it's fascinating to consider people who've made great uh, intellectual um, discoveries. discoveries. Yep. Mm, well, all of them that I can think of at the moment started out as very humble and also developed themselves in other areas, such as music. They weren't limited simply to... They were very um, focused on desire, which is an aspect of the soul. And the fact that they didn't know and they needed to discover something, which is humble in itself. And they were always learning. So that was they were humble to learning. They yep. wanted to experiment a lot, which yep. is an indication of a humble soul. A, yep. a person who doesn't experiment is not generally a very humble person. Yes, yep. yes. Um, and so many of them, many of the people who we know have really made huge intellectual discoveries in our yeah. history had those attributes. Correct. Sometimes we see, though, that after making that discovery, they lose some humility. And therefore lose the attributes of further discovery. Yes. Which is an interesting thing. There, there, there are other impediments that start developing within the soul to learning yeah. and one of the major impediments is a lack of humility yeah. and as that develops there is an impediment to absorbing new information yeah. an impediment to becoming more loving yeah. and as a result their understanding of other information that they have not yet discovered is limited yeah. so usually you find people who have uh, that people who have discoveries and then they get to a point usually uh, as a bit uh, in their older age usually it is, where they don't actually make many new discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually because of the growing lack of humility that occurs. Yeah. Now, there are some people historically who haven't been like that so much and, and who, you know, they, they were humble through the entire process. And as a result, uh, they made discoveries most of their life. Mm. Um, and that, that is the subsequent result of this same law in operation. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yep. Okay. Are you happy to continue? Sure. If you perhaps read the next two paragraphs. Sure. Yeah. As such, the mind by itself is incapable of determining, absorbing or understanding all of the divine truths of the universe without the other attributes or characteristics of the soul being engaged along with and controlling the mind's processes. If any person elects to just listen to the truth with their mind, they will never become at one with God nor will they ever actually understand or be able to automatically practice the divine truth in their daily life, nor can they ever be automatically loving in all circumstances and conditions. The mind by itself or influenced by a soul in error with regard to love can be completely irrational and illogical, while at the same time 
believing itself to be completely sane, rational and logical. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? It is, it is. And um, we've kind of touched on, on that already. But yeah. I, I brought an example with me and it comes from an email that um, I received recently. Sure. And this is from someone who <coughs> believes themselves to be very rational and logical. Yes. And I just thought perhaps I'd read a few of their statements. Sure. Um, and it, we can just... Um, show how illogical someone who thinks they're quite logical can be. Yes. Um, yep. And I would certainly put my... And this is a person who's listened to Divine Truth for six years or so. Yeah, yep. yeah. So um, this person's saying, I need to work through the feeling that if 90% of a teacher's class, and this is with reference to yourself, yes. um, isn't progressing after years of trying, mm -hmm. then at least some of this must reflect on the quality of the teaching. Already there's an illogical statement mm -hmm. because it's also possible from a logical perspective that they think they're trying when they're not actually trying. Yes. <laughs> that's also possible. Yes. yes. But, but that's not stated, of course. No. No. Uh, and... Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> if we just continue the... Yeah. Uh, I intellectually understand mm -hmm. that although we may have spent decades searching for spiritual truth and on dedicated spiritual paths, that we may still not be prepared to do what needs to be done. Well, see, again, I feel there's this focus on what needs to be done rather than a focus on needing to become more loving. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a part of the problem, is that the mind says, give me the rules and I'll go and do them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. But the soul often is incapable of doing them unless you release certain emotions that prevent you from taking certain actions. Mm -hmm. This is an example of how the soul is governing the mind and yet the mind believes itself to be taking an action that the soul has not engaged. Yeah. Yeah, and even this, but even this idea that 90% of a teacher's class, yep. if they're not progressing, then that must reflect on the quality of the teaching. That to me seems to overlook a huge ingredient and that is the will of those in the class. Correct. It's actually stating that the teacher is in charge of the will of the student. Which is incorrect, obviously. Yeah, yeah. that's illogical to me. Yes, if we took this logic to, its, to the logic that he is using here yeah. to its full conclusion, God is the worst teacher of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> because, because hardly anybody in the whole universe is actually absorbed most of the information God's willing to provide. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, under using this analogy, we're basically saying that, uh, that God is the worst teacher in the universe because hardly anybody knows anything about what God knows. In spite of God creating an entire universe, which is designed to teach us Correct. about ourselves and about him. Correct. Yeah. And again, it also minimises the use of our will. Yeah. It also minimises this quality of humility. Yeah. Obviously, we're unable to learn, even if we think we're able to learn, we're unable to learn unless we have true humility. Yeah. The majority of people that, I've, that I feel who are associated with divine truth have yet to develop true humility. Mm. And so they think they know things they don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I feel this, this fellow is in exactly the same boat. He thinks he knows things that he doesn't know yet. And then he blames me for not understanding them correctly or not being able to feel the benefits of them. Yeah. And of course, you can't feel the benefits of something the soul hasn't grown with. Yeah. So, sure, he says he understands intellectually, and I feel those two words should never be placed together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the reason why I feel that is because um, when we say to ourselves, I understand intellectually something, but mm -hmm. really we don't even understand it intellectually. Because yeah. the intellectual understanding of something is only possible once the soul is free to actually understand it and therefore pass on its understanding to the intellect. Yep. And this is a part of the problem that people face is they keep telling themselves they understand something when it's only, they've only heard it. Yes. They don't understand it. No. They haven't applied it in their day-to-day -day life. They've only heard it. Yeah. And hearing something doesn't cause change. No. But it's a part of something that can trigger change, yeah. but it doesn't cause change. Change yeah. is caused by, as we will discuss later, yeah. the soul being engaged yes. through a process. Yes. And I suppose what struck me between the eyes was 
a person was saying to me, and they say later in their their message to me, that they are quite logical, or they refer to their logic, yep. um, and ration, rationalising. Yeah, but, uh, logic, but every irrational. statement we've read so far is illogical. <laughs> That's yes, the irony. <laughs> yes, and to me, I, I suppose it struck me that someone who has attended six years of lectures which speak about the very things that you spoke of about the necessity for the soul to be engaged and the necessity for the will to be engaged and the fact that you will never attempt to coerce the will of a student, Correct. Call it student or force the will of a student or, or force, coerce or manipulate or, manipulate or anything. Or <laughs> egg on because yeah, the yeah. whole point is for each student to engage their will Correct. with God and not with you. Correct. So then I can't see how they can see that it's a logical statement to say then if 90% of them aren't doing that, that that's your fault. Correct. When in fact... Because I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and if, every, if somebody follows the teachings that I'm given, then they'd probably finish up doing it if yeah. they really follow it in their soul. Yes. But yeah. see, this is the trouble is most people will think they're following it, but they're only, they've only heard it. Yeah. They haven't followed it yet. Yeah. And they only try to take actions without there being any soul-based change. Yeah. And what we're trying to do in this particular session is explain to people why they are stagnant. Yes. The reason why they're stagnant, and in fact the reason why this man is stagnant, is for this exact reason. He yeah. does not understand how the soul works, and as a result, he has yet to engage the soul's operations, yeah. and as a result, he can't practice divine truth, even though he thinks he wants to. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, I suppose, also obviously engaging with that soul process is about developing humility and growing ourselves in love. And when that doesn't happen, then we can think we're being logical when, in fact, there is no logic in no. our statements. No, and the reality is if we took this man's statements as logical, then it logically follows that God is the worst teacher of the universe. And I definitely cannot agree with that. No. Because that God is the person who hardly anybody listens to. <laughs> <laughs> and hardly anybody follows what God suggests. Yeah. Yep. And I would, I would certainly not then say that God is the worst teacher of the universe as a result. Well, even because we know God has created not just a class or a classroom or a lecture, an entire, entire universe universes. that is universes. to teach. <laughs> universes. And that any person within it, regardless of their age, their race, even their, even their intellect, even their intellect, can begin to learn about God without anyone else being around them. Correct. Now, to me, that's a pretty awesome teacher. Yeah. But if we begin to measure the value of teachers based on the will of their students... To me, that's not logical. Yeah. I just can't understand how that's logical. Yeah. And let's look at the way teaching occurs on the planet. Generally, the way teaching occurs on the planet is that it only occurs when there is a goal at the end. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where I feel a lot of people struggle with divine truth too because there is no real end goal. It's, it's, it's infinite progression that mm. is the goal. So therefore, you will always be changing. Uh, whereas what most people are used to is have a two or three year class and then they get a certificate yeah. and that's the whole reason why they did it in the first place. Yes. In other words, they did it for an addictive reason. They wanted an, a result at the end that they could conceive and they only did it for that purpose. And the reality is if we are ta taking that approach with divine truth, we're never going to learn it mm -hmm. because it has to be driven by a desire for the relationship with God yeah. rather than a desire for any end goal other than that. That, that we might achieve. And as a result, there's no addictions that are ever going to be fed through the process. Yeah. yeah, and humility is the state of embracing constant learning, constant receipt of new truth from yeah. God, from those around us, learning from everything around us. It's yeah. saying living in a state of humility, which is the part, a significant part of the way, and most people means, have yet to understand what that means. Yeah, yeah, well, but it does mean we are perpetually saying, I want more knowledge, I don't have it all. Yes, yes. <laughs> so as soon as we get into this... But it's not just more knowledge. You see, and this is where we've got to be careful. Yes. We're not... See, this is where the people like this man who have focused their life on the, the, on the absorption of more intellectual knowledge yeah. really struggle with divine truth. Yeah. They believe that they have spiritual development because their mind tells them so. Mm. But the reality is the spirit, true spiritual development is about love. Yeah. This is the whole, the, how the soul functions is all about love. Mm. It's not about the intellect. And so you can tell yourself things with your intellect that have no bearing whatsoever on the true condition of your soul. Yeah. 
and, and, and it's only its development in love that is going to cause any change. And unless you're willing to develop your soul in love, either natural love or God's love, your soul will not change. Mm. And it doesn't matter how good the teacher is, <laughs> you will not do it yeah. because, because of your own resistance and other issues that we need to discuss about how the soul functions. Yeah, I suppose I feel now that any knowledge is not real unless it is in the soul. It's Correct. Just, that's it's what just I mean a, it's by It's just a thought. It's, not, it's, it's just something we've heard. Yeah. It means nothing, no. actually. And it has no impact or bearing generally on our lives either, if we've just heard it. Yeah. I have about six years of university education and um, I often used to joke about the things that I've learnt and forgotten are amazing. You know, yeah. I've learnt and forgotten a lot of things, which shows that... I didn't receive it in the soul. In the soul. I was just memorising and regurgitating. And Correct. Yeah. Because once you really learn something, it's in your soul permanently. It ne you yeah. never lose it. Yeah. You know, you know, it never goes away. And if it's truth, divine truth, it never goes away. Yeah. If it's error mixed with truth, then obviously it's refined. Yeah. But, uh, but, it, but yeah, if you truly learn something in your soul, it never really goes away. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. So you can't lose your memory of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, professionally, you also know that the things that you have experience with, yeah. it's, and this is why I think a lot of people criticise university education, because you do a lot of theory before practice a yeah. lot of times. And, but you know that once you've had a practical application of some of the things... It's much it, easier to remember. You, you retain it. Correct. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's now in your experience, yes. in your soul's experience. Yes. And this is why it's, I find it quite ironic, really, is because that a lot of the things that people know about learning and teaching are actually where they have engaged their soul in some direction without actually understanding how the soul works. Yeah. If you really understood how the soul works, you could teach the soul far faster yes. and more effectively than yeah. what we currently are able to teach the soul yeah. of the humans. Of yeah. humans. Yeah. So, so it's very important for us to understand these principles because it's going to affect like it's going to affect every area of our life but it's going to affect how even education is embraced mm, mm. if people understood these principles yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i get a bit uh, i think it's it's kind of crazy when people criticize you as a teacher because i watch you you're humble you um, embrace, you live the example of what you teach, mm. but you also constantly attempt to find a point of engagement with people mm -hmm. without altering their will. It's just a point, and mm -hmm. many good teachers do that. But mm. God does that, mm. is constantly trying to find a point of engagement yeah. with a person. And that doesn't mean the teacher made a mistake with the previous point of engagement. <laughs> no. What it means is the teacher who loves you and he cares about you and he wants to try to work out a way that he can get Yes. Some information into your soul yes. <laughs> with, yes. and try to work around a lot of your resistances and denials. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Anyway, yeah. let's continue. Sure. Um, I keep reading the next two. Yeah. The mind is controlled by the soul. The mind can never fully control the soul since the soul is not an attribute of the mind, nor is it subordinate to the mind, but rather the mind is subordinate to the soul because it is one of the many attributes of the soul. The soul will always eventually determine the beliefs, actions, thoughts and words of the individual. I suppose that's a natural, there's nothing, I think that's a pretty clear yeah. statement. Yeah. When it comes to the absorption of truth by the soul and the mind, there are a number of basic understandings regarding how the soul operates that one needs to understand before we can really discuss what it means to live in truth. Mm -hmm. My reference to truth in the discussion below all refer to God's truth divine truth, or as it can be also called, the absolute truth of the universe. All right, so that's, the, that's your preamble that you wrote before we go on to discuss the different ways that the human soul functions, yeah. the different principles. Yes. Um, I suppose I, some of the questions I had just rising from that, and you've covered a lot, we've covered a lot of what we we're going to talk about. But, but let's answer the rest of those questions. And Yep. I think there's two more, isn't it, that, that you had down there. The world's general idea that the mind is the ultimate tool. <laughs> yes, for experiencing the world. Yeah. And this is a problem, obviously, because it's not based in reality. We are a soul with a mind, not a, not a mind with a soul. Yeah, well, like. let's even be more specific, shall yeah. we? The human body, the physical body, has a brain. 
The brain controls the physiological processes within the body itself. Mm -hmm. The brain is not you and it is not your mind. Then the spirit body, which is another body that is a part that's created at the time of your conception, it also has the DNA structure, it also has organs and it has a mind, a brain in fact, but it's not the mind of the soul. It is a brain that controls the physiological functions of the spirit body. It controls how the spirit body works and operates. And if a person in their physical body uh, loses a part of their brain, they, other parts of the brain can learn those functions. Mm -hmm. And that is a well-known fact. This is proof that the memories contained within that experience can't be contained within the mind because otherwise they would have died completely when that part of the brain died. Mm -hmm. So this is an indication that the information is coming from somewhere else, somewhere else other than the physical body's brain. Also, a spirit has the same experience. A spirit can lose a part of their brain through certain emotional conditions and therefore act as if they don't have a memory of something. But once they recover their operation of through, through some emotions, they deal with some emotions, that part of the brain fires up again. And as a result, the memories get passed from the soul to that part of the brain. It's the soul that contains the mind. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very specific about this. The physical body's brain is not the mind. The spirit body's brain is not the mind. The mind, the true mind, belongs to the soul. It's an organ of the soul. Whether it's developed or not, it's an organ of the soul. For most people, it's a very poorly developed organ of the soul. Mm. But uh, it's still an organ of the soul. As such, it can potentially exist without the two bodies. So it can definitely exist without the physical body because we have proof of that all the time in the spirit world. And it can also potentially exist without the spirit body. Mm. The mind can still exist because it's an organ of the soul. Now, that, that being the case, this means then that every time we focus on our intellectual development rather than our soul development, we are attempting to focus on the development of an organ rather than the entire being. Mm. And this is fraught with dangers. And, and often these dangers are very palpable. We see them in society where people have been focused in their intellectual development. For example, a scientist focused in his intellectual development develops the atomic bomb, and then they drop it. Right? That is not a very loving act. There's obviously aspects of the soul that have yet to be developed. Mm. Right? Yep. That would enable not the discovery of the atomic bomb, but the use of it. Mm. So the fact that we can discover certain things is fine. It's how we use them that is governed by other organs in the soul. Mm. And obviously, a lot of people use the knowledge they've found or discovered in a very poor way, completely out of harmony with love and completely out of harmony with humility or a lot of other aspects of the soul which are far more important to develop. Mm. So this is where we've got to be very careful and this is why the world has so many problems because we're so intellectually dominant we have forgotten the development of other aspects of the soul. And in particular, two aspects, the development of love and the development of our, our will in harmony with love. Mm. We've forgotten these two forms of development. And, uh, and these two forms of development are far more important to us and our future and also the survival of, the, of humanity than the development of the intellect. Mm. The intellect, of course, will develop as a result of developing these other two things. So I'm not saying that the intellect won't be developed. I'm saying we'll have a highly developed society, which also is developed in these other aspects of the soul. Yeah. 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 And then we had a third question, didn't we, yeah. about people believing they're logical. And I think we've sort of answered that, haven't we? But I wanted to talk about the flow of information in, the, in that with regard to logic. You see, oftentimes we sort of think we're logical, but we don't know the emotions that are governing this kind of logic that we're exhibiting. So, so for example, if you put a person in a war, they will eventually believe, given enough uh, problems and trauma, they will often eventually believe that it's okay to kill other people. 
under certain circumstances, whether it's okay to defend yourself by killing another person or it's okay to defend your wife or your children by killing another person, they'll eventually generally believe that given today's society. Now, they believe that because of a feeling in their soul mm -hmm. that is not logical at all. Mm -hmm. But the soul, because it's open to this feeling, allows that thought to pass through and therefore distort the logic of the individual. Because it makes no sense if I kill you, then sooner or later someone with you with the, around you with the same belief is going to want to kill me. And if I kill more of you, more of your family, then they'll probably want to kill more of my family. Eventually this will escalate and escalate, turn into a national war and eventually become even worse. And, and, and in this last century just passed, we had world wars governed by that particular concept. <laughs> And as uh, Gandhi said, you know, eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. There's the demonstration of true logic. Yeah. What, what he said was a demonstration of true logic. Now, why did he have that logic when the average person on the earth has a completely different logic? He had that logic because he had more love in his soul. Mm -hmm. And this love in his soul governed, he could see very clearly that the logic that other people were using wasn't logical at all. It was completely illogical. Yeah. It made no sense whatsoever for the long-term survival of the human race. And so he could see that very clearly because he had more love in his soul. And this is an example of how when you've got more love in your soul or your soul is further developed, you get to see things logically completely different mm -hmm. to how, or completely differently to how other people see them. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the reason for this is that when there is an emotion in the soul... Only certain types of information are allowed to pass in the mind of the individual connected to the, uh, who, who, of, the, of that soul, yep. of that individual. So if I have a, f a feeling in my soul that preservation of myself at all costs is justified, yep. then it, my mind will logically assume from that particular feeling that I can defend myself to the point of killing somebody else. Yeah, so basically you're saying that our logic is based upon what we believe is true. Correct. And when there are false beliefs or errors within what we believe to be truth and we base our reasoning upon On those, those errors, things, our logic will actually become very illogical. Very illogical. In, and in fact, even irrational and sometimes even psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> That's how bad it can become. Yeah. And yet we think that it's logical. Yeah. Right. So this is a big problem uh, that people need to understand, I feel. The flow of information inside from the soul to the mind and inside the mind through the intellect into our expression is completely governed by the feelings and belief systems that are, that are inside of the soul at any mm -hmm. one point in time. It's not governed by logic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I would classify as true logic, because true logic is always in harmony with love, always in harmony with truth, always in harmony with humility and always in harmony with many other qualities that are like that, you know, harmony with ethics and, and those kind of qualities. Most people don't have true logic. I've met, you know, very intellectually developed people who I would consider to be almost totally illogical when it comes to certain reasonings mm -hmm. and arguments. Mm -hmm. And you can reason with them and once you reason with them on those particular subjects that they're illogical, they get angry. <laughs> they get angry, they get, they get uh, you know, critical, not only just critical, but they become violently abusive with their, with their rage. And that's all because they know they're being illogical. <laughs> mm. and, uh, and they know that the logic that's being presented to them is confronting certain emotions inside of them yeah, that isn't cause it, them to respond that way. Isn't it because that they, the emotions, the error-based emotions are being challenged yes. through the expression of logic. Correct. And because there's a fear of those things, yes. then there's a resistance placed up to that. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So, so I feel it's very important to say that any soul-based emotions and beliefs that are out of harmony with the laws of love, there's going to be a resistance to the flow of true logical information coming into our mind. Yeah. And as a result of that, we are going to think we're logical when we're totally illogical mm. and we'll make no sense at all. And we believe we're making sense. Yeah. That's the trouble. Yeah. 
we believe we're making sense when we're making no logical sense at all if we analyse all of the factors. Yeah. So, and so with the example you gave before of the man who made the statement about my teaching, mm -hmm. he hadn't thought that if he took that logical argument to its full conclusion, that he's really saying that God is the worst teacher of the, uh, in the universe. Yeah. He hasn't thought through this so-called logical argument that he has. And therefore, the argument is not logical. It is driven by his emotions. And let's talk about some of the emotions that are driving it. The emotions that are driving are, are his own resistance to feelings, his own resistance to emotions, his belief that other people have a problem before he does, in other words, his own arrogance and his lack of humility. These are all the emotions in his soul that are driving that thought. Yeah. Because if he thought in a far more humble and loving manner, he'd see that God, who's the best teacher in the universe, has hardly any connection to most of the people on this planet, right, in comparison to what's possible, and that is because of the resistance of the individual and the use of their will. Yeah. And why could that also not apply to my teaching others? Yeah. He, would, he would automatically see that. Yeah. So it seems very clear that our understanding of what is logical is based on what we believe to be truth. Yes. And if, if we are wrong in what we believe to be true, then we cannot be logical. Because we, our, our mind or our intellect is only functioning with what the soul is saying is truth. Yeah. And let's be and more definite about it. If we are wrong from God's perspective, because yep. that's really the perspective we're looking at here, if we're wrong from God's perspective, even though we're right from our own, we will not be logical. Yeah. We, we, in fact, it's impossible for us yeah. to be so. Yeah. And this is why humankind make many, many very intellectually developed people on this planet make very unwise choices and decisions. Yeah. And the main reason why is because they have not developed these other aspects of their soul that are more important to develop than their intellect. Mm. And, and it, as that uh, message that I received went on, that man began to make what he felt were more logical assumptions about your action and behaviour and your, predicting your future actions even based on things that were not truth from God's perspective. And Correct. so and we're so not even indicative of what you were doing, what you were thinking or what you or were going what to I do. what I will do. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. He's making a lot of presumptions and assumptions based on his own illogical argument. And yeah. that's not my logical argument. Yeah. My logical argument is more encompassing love and truth and therefore I will not take the actions that he thinks I will in the future. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. Well, that's just... A bit about our introduction. Yeah, yeah, so that's probably the conclusion of our introduction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, now we're going to continue our discussion on how the human soul functions. And this is a discussion and some questions about the principle of preclusion. So, Jesus, would you share with us, <laughs> would you like to read your um, description of preclusion? Or yeah, just wanna... probably, I think. Yeah. You know, I think it's good to go over it again. Um, yeah. So I've said, preclusion is the principle that if a certain truth on a given subject is within the soul, it precludes error on the same subject from existing in the soul at the same time. And if error exists within the soul, it precludes truth on the same subject from existing within the soul at the same time. So basically, this understanding of preclusion helps the individual understand and accept the current state or condition of their own soul development in contrast to the current state of their mind. For example, this can demonstrate to the individual that the true state of their soul is that the truth on the subject has yet to enter even when they believe it has entered. This can also explain to the person why they are still finding it difficult to act in harmony with the truth they have believed themselves to have already accepted because it is not yet in the soul. The soul does not operate like the mind with regard to the existence of truth. With the mind, truth and error are capable of existing in the same mind at the same time on the same subject. Thoughts can be experienced either from the external environment or coming from the operations of the soul that can be in complete disharmony with one another mm. in the mind. Mm. So what basically preclusion is saying is helping us describe the condition of our soul right at this snapshot in time. That's how I view it, like a snapshot. This is how it is. Yeah. Yes. 
So it's basically saying that the reason why we aren't any further developed than what we currently are is because the truth that we thought entered us never entered us. <laughs> yeah. And the error that we thought left us hasn't left us yet. Yeah. And that's why we're in the state we currently are. Yeah. And, and preclusion says, while the error remains, the truth can't enter either. And, while any, and if any truth remains, then the error can never come back into it again. Yeah. In the soul, that is. So the soul itself has this beautiful ability to not be able to absorb new error without... The mind can, of course, but the soul can't. Yeah. Once truth is there. Yeah. And what I like about... Or how I kind of visualise that is that you've got a container mm -hmm. and if part of it is occupied by error then truth cannot occupy, nothing else can occupy that space Correct. until you make space for it. And same goes with the truth. If truth is occupying that space about that particular issue, yep. then error can't exist there at the same time either. Yeah, not in the soul itself. Not in the soul itself. Yep. And that is... It can exist in our intellect or our mind. Yeah. That's the, because the mind isn't, that's just a part of the soul. It's not the soul itself. Yeah. It's just an organ of the soul. It can, in, in, it can exist in our brain. Of I our suppose, spirit, physical yeah, bodies. yeah. I find that a little um, sort of. Well, for a reincarnated person, or let's not call it a reincarnated person, a person who has visited the earth for a second time, yeah. that is the difficult thing. Because the soul contains all this truth that the mind is not unwilling to express. Yeah, mm -hmm. I find it hard to relate to having a mind in my soul that can hold error and truth within it because to me the soul just has truth or error. No, I'm saying the mind is in the spirit body. The mind in this case is the intellectual thoughts that are contained within the spirit form. Okay. That it, which is completely independent to the spirit, the soul's mind. Okay, so let's differentiate that because at yes. one point in this discussion you said that the mind is like an organ of the soul. The mind is an organ of the soul. Yep. 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 But let, for the purposes of clarity, because you just now I'm talking about yep. the truth about this mind, whereas whereas sometimes we're talking about the error about the mind and what everybody normally believes. Yeah. So, so we've got to be different. We've got to differentiate between these two things. Yep. The truth about the mind is that it's an organ of the soul, mm -hmm. and it's impossible for that mind to contain any anything other than what the soul dictates. That's the truth about that mind. But the intellectual mind is capable of reasoning in the spirit body. Yeah. That's a part of the function of the brain of the spirit body. Yeah. And that particular brain is capable of having thoughts that are completely out of harmony with the mind of the soul. Yeah. So, and that's where I think I come a bit undone because we've got two minds and to me there's no mind. I don't, there's a part of my soul that reasons but it's totally based on my emotions, my aspirations, my yes. desires, my, those yes. things. For, um, the, for the sake of simplification, yep. we can say that, this, that the soul has a functioning that is completely independent of intellect. Yes. Whereas the spirit body's mind does have its own intellect mm -hmm. and, and is able to express and absorb information independent of the soul. Yep. yep. And so for the purposes of defining preclusion, yes. we are saying that anywhere within the soul... Anything within the soul. Or any, in any space within the soul, soul. Correct. If there is error occupying... That it, space. That space, truth cannot be there. Correct. If there is truth, error cannot be there. Correct. So let's just give an example perhaps. If right at this moment in time, I have a poor sense of my own worth... If that is true, then I am not able to think my way into having worth. Mm -hmm. I must first release the reasons why I have a poor sense of my own worth from my soul. And then that part of the soul is able to absorb a sense of worth. Yes. And that's independent of whether I think I'm worth something or not. Yes. And this is where <laughs> I wanted to contrast. Yes. There's a reasoning part of our soul that is either in truth or error and it can't have um, conflicting things. Yeah. And then we have our spirit body and our physical body's brain and mind. Yes. And this is the part Which of us that might attempt to think our way... Through something. Through, through into having more self-worth. Correct, but it will be unsuccessful. Right. 
it will always be unsuccessful. Yeah. And this is the reason why most religious religion forms on the earth are unsuccessful. Yep. They all promote love, supposedly, and yet most of them have been the cause of most of the wars yeah. that we've ever experienced in the last 2,000 years. Yeah. And the reason why that is is because love hasn't touched the soul yet. Yes. It's just an intellectual concept, and many of them even say that. They even say that love is an intellectual concept, and while it remains an intellectual concept for them, it's never going to touch their heart, as the saying goes, or their soul. And as a result, they will never act lovingly given certain circumstances. Yes. So they will be willing to go to war under certain circumstances. If the circumstance is, you killed my son, then I'll go to war. If the circumstances is, you believe something different to me, then I'll go to war. And they'll go to war without consideration of love because love has not yet touched their soul. It's only an intellectual concept. Yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. And, and it... They have, they have other feelings inside of their soul, which are true. Yeah. They have feelings of rage and feelings of, like, about a person with a different religious faith, for example, or they have feelings of rage about somebody who's harmed their, their family. And it's those feelings that are the truth mm -hmm. that govern their action. And if you look at what their actions, they'll go to war, they are governed by the rageful feelings within their soul, the justifications that are truly going on within their soul. And they might think they're a nice person and think they love and think they're a nice, kind individual that uh, would never consider harming another. And in their day-to-day -day normal life, they might act that way. But when it comes to a pressure cooker situation where their family or somebody's religious faith is being attacked, now they revert back to the soul's true understanding. Yeah. which is, I'm enraged with the person having that idea, so I'm going to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's their understanding. Yeah. And there's an example of how the mind, thinking that they're loving, had no effect on them whatsoever. Yeah. No yeah. effect. And so uh, there in your notes you said, this, this principle of preclusion helps us to understand why we still think, act and feel the way we do even after we have received something different in our intellect. Correct. So all we've done is heard it yep. and it's gone into our memory. Yep. That's all we've done. Yep. And while that is an actual memory of the event, it hasn't entered our soul and changed it. Mm -hmm. It's only a memory of what we've heard. Yes. So when somebody tells you God is love, for most people that is just a memory of what they've heard. The majority of people on this planet do not believe it. Mm. their soul acts totally differently. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the same goes with uh, most other of our other belief systems. We have only heard them. We are yet to actually have them as a true belief within our soul. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of work that um, many of us have done in natural love uh, circles or even in... Um, psychological practice has been a lot about trying to think our way into a different state. Correct. And this principle says that that is impossible. It is impossible. Yeah. It is impossible. There are people who have thought themselves out of a state for 2,000 years, but as soon as you have a chat to them, they revert straight back to the same behaviours they would have under, under the circumstances. And that is because that emotion still exists in their soul. Correct. Yeah. So, so while the emotion governing the action still exists within the soul, or the emotion precluding the action that still exists in the soul, you're going to revert to that behaviour. There is no other option, in fact. And it's a great thing, actually, because that's the way we learn what's really there. Yeah. So, so, for example, if you're walking down the street or driving in a car and somebody cuts you off or pushes you, right, and you get angry and upset, well, there's an example. There's an example. Love hasn't touched your soul yet on that issue. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. It hasn't touched your soul yet because your reaction is telling you that it hasn't touched your soul yet. You can think yourself beyond that, but that initial reaction is the reaction that your soul has. Yeah. And that's the truth of what's really going on in your soul. Yeah. And preclusion is telling you that it's impossible for you to actually put another truth in there unless you release the error of that emotion. Yes. It's a, unless you release that error, no other truth can actually enter you. So you can, you can think your way, oh, I'm a loving person now, I'm a loving person now, I'm going to do loving things now, and 10 years later someone pushes you and you'll get angry again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because nothing has changed in the soul. Yeah. For you to not be angry under that circumstance, something has to change in your soul first. Yes, yeah. 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 Okay, so that 
Is that all that you would like to say on preclusion today? Yes, I think we've discussed the issues of like how something, when you believe something inside of yourself, it prevents another belief from entering you, no matter how much you think your way through it. And yeah. this is why there's a lot of confusion regarding religion on the planet, because because you know there's a rule book in most religions you, you must do this or commandments you can call them you must do this you must do that you must do this you must do that most people practice those particular things but they don't feel them and as a result they still feel like not practicing them yeah and sooner or later they do that they they, they stop practicing. they, they yeah. disobey yeah. and then they feel a little guilty and then they have to have feel sorry and then they have to pray for God for repentance for feeling sorry that they didn't act a certain way and it's all happening because the the thing that caused it is still in their soul mm. and until it comes out they are precluded from change yeah it is going to be their condition is going to continue to be exactly what it is right now until something gets released from the soul so that something new can enter it mm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to move on in a minute to talk about the next principle. Um, but these two principles, preclusion and our next one is absorption, they, uh, and perhaps after we talk about absorption, we can delineate between the two. Sure. Because sure. I feel that there's scope for a bit of... If at the moment in conclusion we basically say that preclusion is this aspect of what is my current condition mm -hmm. and why is it my current condition? It's my current condition because there are things in my soul that preclude me from changing. Yeah. Right? So in the case of, an exa of our other examples that we could give, any person who desires change and who is not changing has a reason for them not changing in their soul. Yep. And what they need to do is find that reason. Yes. Once they find that reason, then they will change. And preclusion is telling you that this has to be the case because change is an automatic result. Mm -hmm. of you finding the reason and releasing it from your soul. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why I find a lot of people who use their intellect to follow divine truth not very successful. And the reason why is because they're trying, using their mind, to, to act in a certain way, a changed way, while at the same time their soul is saying, don't do that, don't do that, do something else. Do, do, you know, the soul is really saying, don't do that, that's wrong. Yeah. You know, even, what, even though their mind's saying it's right, their soul's saying, don't do that, that's wrong. So you put a person in a situation where their child is harmed by another person, the average person will revert to rage. The average person will revert to trying to protect the child through violence, right? Why is that? Because that feeling is still in their soul. And for any change to happen, that feeling has to come out of their soul. That's the, and that's what preclusion is. Preclusion is while you have this feeling in your soul, Nothing can change. That is your condition and it will be your condition for as long as you retain that condition in your soul. It's going to stay like that forever, potentially. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's probably not possible given an infinite amount of time. Sooner or later, somebody realises, oh, maybe I need to change. <laughs> but uh, in, a pra in practice, you can take many thousands of years to change on a single issue if you don't understand that the reason why you're not changing is because you have a belief in your soul, you're unwilling to change. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So Thank that you. basically concludes our discussion about preclusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is a continuation of our discussion of how the human soul functions and we're up to principle mm. number two. So this will be a discussion and questions about the principle of absorption. So, darling, <laughs> tell us about absorption. Well, should we read my comments first and then we can have a discussion about some of the questions that we might yeah. have? So absorption is the principle that truth cannot be absorbed by the soul or flow into the soul on a given subject while error existing within the soul precludes the absorption of the truth and error cannot be absorbed by the soul or flow into the soul on a given subject while truth is present and precludes the absorption of the error. Mm -hmm. So it applies for both error and truth. Yep. So if I have truth in my soul, and it's really in my soul and I have a developed intellect, mm -hmm. this uh, error cannot any longer flow into my soul after that point. Yep. Of course, it depends on me having a developed intellect. And of course, for most people who have developed truth in a certain area, that would be the case. Mm -hmm. there's, un there's certain circumstances where it's not, but it doesn't apply to the most, most of humanity. Yep. 
It says, this understanding of absorption helps the individual understand and reflect upon the process of change yes. or the change of state or condition as it affects the soul. That is, for the truth to enter the soul, error must first be released from the soul or not already be present. Mm -hmm. For error to enter the soul, truth must first either be relinquished or not be already present within yep. the soul. Yep. So what we're basically saying there is that it, it, the only way the soul can change is by understanding the principle of absorption. And that is, I can only absorb the new thing if the old thing's gone. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that's the, that's the only way I can do it. Or it wasn't there in the first place. Yes. All right. So in the case of a child or a little baby, um, because they're a new incarnation under the earth, there's a lot of things that are not there already in terms of the understanding of truth. And so the, it's quite easy to absorb the error for that child. And this is why it's such an important role being a parent, because yeah. we've got to be very careful with what we do as a parent, because anything that we present to the child that is actually an error from God's perspective will be absorbed by that soul yeah. automatically, because there's nothing to prevent that soul from absorbing it. So they're like an open book. And I think there was a quote of a, a priest or someone who said once that you give me a child before the age of seven and I can make him into my to the Christian faith. I forget the faith yeah. it was, uh, you know, make him into that faith. Yeah. And the reason why is because that child is going to absorb all of the error or truth that the person who's teaching them has Perhaps. over a period of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's not an intellectual absorption, it's a soul-based emotional absorption of mm -hmm. that information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If an individual has heard what they believe is the truth and believes they have accepted such truth, but is also aware that the soul contains beliefs and emotions that are in disharmony with that truth, and they often act upon those disharmonious emotions, then this is proof that the truth heard has really yet to enter the soul and cause change to the soul and therefore only exists as a belief, and I wouldn't even say a belief, it only exists as a thought or a memory in their own mind. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's all it is. Yeah. 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 So uh, in the previous discussion, we were talking about preclusion, and this is, this is where these two marry so much, isn't it? Yes. It's because when error has entered us or truth has entered us, then it precludes anything else entering us on that same topic. Correct. And this um, principle of absorption is about how we go about change. Changing that. How it happens. Yes. And, um, and I like what you said there that, you know, many people believe they've accepted a new truth when the error is still dictating their, or the, the yeah. previous belief, emotional belief, is still dictating how they act and what happens in their life yes. and how they feel and how they respond and yes. all of these things. And you see this out, like, honestly, when you look at every, like the average person on, on Earth, their day-to-day -day life, you see it in every moment of their day-to-day -day life, pretty much. Yeah. You know, the average person who believes they're loving is often not very loving in, in almost a moment-by-moment -moment um, time frame Basis, yeah, yeah. and uh, it, and that's quite sad yeah. but it's because they believe they're loving while at the same time acting upon all of these unloving emotions that are within them that they're unwilling to release yeah. and it, uh, in the end God can't change what we're unwilling to release mm -hmm. God can only have an effect of change when we're willing to go through a process of release Yep. And this is also part of what we need to learn is that many people believe that just because they have a new thought, they've gone through the process and they haven't. Yeah. And, th and that's why they haven't changed. So true, true change can only happen when you go through the change by releasing the emotional causal error of, that causes or preclude, that precludes the truth from entering. Yeah. And once you do that, you can absorb a new truth. Uh-huh. Yeah. And this is really, this principle really strikes to the heart of what you are talking to people about in lectures all of the time. Yeah. You are saying that there is a situation in your soul right now as it exists and the only way for it to change and for you to change permanently is for you to engage this principle called absorption, yeah. which is to create a situation in your soul where new absor absorption of truth is possible. Exactly. And that's only possible if other You're things get moving. <laughs> to release the error. Yes. Yes. That's what I think about preclusion as like the snapshot in time, the rock hard cement that yeah. is there now. Yeah. But absorption is the principle where everything can get 
moving again. We yes. can unconstipate our soul Correct. and let, yeah. let things out yeah. so that new things can come in. Correct. So yeah. absorption is about allowing the change. Yeah. How do I allow the change? Yeah. How do I sincerely change? Yeah. If you understand absorption, you understand it's pointless trying to change with your intellect. Yeah. You give that up, in fact. Yeah. You give up trying to change things externally and you focus all of your attention in changing your soul. Yeah. changing how your soul loves in particular yeah. because remember progression is all about love yes. so so about changing how your soul loves and that means getting rid of the unloving feelings inside of the soul yeah. and releasing them so that your soul is capable of becoming more loving that's yeah. how change occurs and it's really sad isn't it the the amount that we just about all of us have been taught to honor the mind and to present a facade because in that way, we, we just try to change the facade and change the thoughts yep. without really focusing on what do I really feel about this topic? And mm. many of us are terrified to even discover what we feel on many topics, yes. aren't we? Yes, yeah, we are. Um, and yet, until we do, we can't engage this principle of, of That's absorption. That's right. And when we look at the other principles, you know, of resistance, suppression and so forth, we can see that a lot of times it's things like judgment in particular that yeah. causes us to engage our will to stop the release of certain emotions. You know, there's certain feelings that we have inside of ourselves that we're not too happy are there, <laughs> even. No. Even ourselves, we're not happy we're <laughs> there. We know they're there, but we're not happy they're there. But we're very, very uh, unwilling to face that they're there, feel, feel them and release them. Yeah. As, a result, as a result, we don't change. Yeah. Uh, all we do is we try to force our action to be a certain thing. And usually when we force our action to be a certain thing without naturally changing, we become very harsh on ourselves and hard. And that's when people become very religiously hard and religiously mm. harsh and, you know, become what you would classify as, what is it, a strong, uh, staunch... Yeah, um, orthodox or well, I'd, I'd even evangelical say, or... Well, um, I'd go even further and become militant, militant in gotcha. their actions, yeah. you know, because they had to be so hard on themselves, so hard on themselves... Yeah trying to keep themselves in line that now they want to do the same to everything, everybody else. Yeah. And that's a very, very dangerous condition because that, that then justifies the, uh, a lot of violence on the planet is justified through that condition. Yeah, yeah. it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is sad. So the principle of absorption is all about the release of the soul's current condition to a new condition. Yes. Basically, yeah. that's what it is. And, yeah. and we can't release the soul's current condition uh, uh, we can't get, obtain the new condition until the current condition is changed, changed in some way through an emotional process, through a soul-based process yeah. that is going to be quite traumatic generally because, because the soul-based beliefs are firmly entrenched as feelings and belief systems within us. Yeah. And they are going to have to be worked through with a diligent effort on our part. And this is where I find most people are unwilling to engage a diligent effort mm -hmm. to discover and release their really true feelings that they have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I understand why you've presented these uh, principles in the way that you have in that first we must understand preclusion. We must understand that if it's there within us, nothing else can enter us. Exactly. So we have to be brave enough, as you just said, to discover what is within us before we can engage with the second principle, which is to start releasing or relieving ourselves of what's within us so that new things can be absorbed. And so that our soul can change. Yeah. So our yeah. soul can progress. Because yeah. true progression is not capable without the soul releasing the things that prevent our progression. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so so it's that, I find it quite sad that people don't get these basic principles because you can, you can teach for years and years and years aspects of divine truth and if a person doesn't get these fundamental principles of how the soul operates, then, then basically it's like talking to the air. You know, mm. you, you don't, the person has no positive response to the divine truth and, and then they become downhearted and disappointed yeah. and disillusioned and, grumpy. And, <laughs> and usually grumpy and angry with the person trying to teach them uh, rather than more honest about why they have such a strong desire to suppress the underlying emotions which are causing their stagnation. Yeah. 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 And that's where most people run into a lot of difficulty with divine truth. Yeah. Mm. 
and and let's so let's talk more about um, the difficulties that people face sure. with divine truth with regard to this process of with absorption. regard to this process because yeah. uh, what I observe is and I've even observed it in myself in the past yeah. is a desire to falsify our progress mm -hmm. even to ourselves yes um, uh, we like maintaining a position about ourselves that far exceeds our true development. Yeah. <laughs> I seem to have both ends of the spectrum problem. In the that, past, that I had... That was also lower or higher than yeah, the true development. Yeah, I wanted to yeah. believe it was better. Yeah. Now I have problems seeing it with clarity of about how the progress I have made. But yeah. um, uh, So this is the way that I see a lot of people avoiding the truth of where they're at and the truth of absorption. Yeah. Um, they seem to avoid this knowledge that it was what you've been saying that change really isn't possible until causal emotion flows yes and so what i see people do is attach a lot of importance to emotion but not causal, causal emotion. emotion yeah and so then i observe people trying to be emotional <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when Without, they don't feel like being that. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, maybe I should say before then. I yeah. should say I see people trying to say they have changed when they haven't been emotional. And when, also they haven't changed and it's quite obvious to the observer that they haven't changed. Their life hasn't changed, their outward demeanour hasn't changed, yeah. their feelings of joy, peace, satisfaction, none of that has changed. changed. They might have but, changed location. Yeah. Or they might have changed partner, or yeah. they might have changed, you know, something yeah. physical in their life. Yes. But their actual feelings haven't changed. Haven't changed. On those issues. Yeah. Um, but a lot of us feel like, well, but I know stuff here. <laughs> and if I think, and it might have even when I heard it felt a little bit nice or a little bit excited or a little bit sad. Mm. Um, but there hasn't been a huge... Uh, outpouring Transition. of emotion out mm. of me, mm. but I want to believe I've changed. And you want to believe you know it. Yes. As and well, which I, is sad. It is sad, isn't mm. it? Um, and many of us can tell ourselves we know it because we can reel it off or speak it or Yeah, that's just the it. memory at work. Yes. You know, it's like yes. any, you, you give a child a whole series of exercises, you drum it into the child often enough, it'll remember it. It doesn't mean the child feels any different. No, that's <laughs> you know right. what I mean? It's like right. if the child wants to steal out of your purse, he's going to steal out of your purse whether you tell him a hundred times he's going to be punished for it or not. If he wants to do it, he'll do it. Yes. In the end, it's only if something changes within his soul that he will actually stop stealing, you know, like... So, so, you know, we, we often think that we can browbeat ourselves and others into submission. And while we may change their actions, mm -hmm. the soul won't progress yeah. because the soul won't change. Yeah. And they'll often feel even more resistive to what we're trying to share with them than less. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can see that we do that because there are certain emotions within us already yeah. which is the principle of preclusion of course about fear of failing wanting to you know fear of being rejected fear of making mistakes yes. fear of our emotion judge of emotion yes. all of these things that then drive us to feel like we want to we want to believe we've changed when we, when haven't, we haven't this we haven't engaged the principle of absorption correct and all of those emotions you listed preclude us from actually exactly. changing yes <laughs> that's the sad <laughs> yes. thing yes. yeah, yeah. And because we're unwilling to feel them, we're actually precluded from changing. So we're absorbing more and more intellectual yeah. memories yeah. of, you know, words being spoken. We remember them, but it had no effect on our entire life. Yeah. And yeah. we still get sick. We still grow old. We still die. We still, yeah. we still act in unloving ways to our partner, our pa family, our children, our friends. You know, we still treat the environment badly and all those other things. And we do it all because nothing's really changed in our soul. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a big mm. issue. Mm. And the other thing that I started to speak about earlier was where people attach importance on emotion rather than understanding that they need to feel the emotions surrounding the error that exists within them. Correct. And I do see people go into a sense of, or go into emotion which is actually them justifying the error that is within them. Yeah, or rebelling. Or rebelling against, against the, the truth. emotion. Or, yeah. yeah, against the truth. Or feeling like, it's not fair I'm not getting what I want. It's not fair that this is yeah. happening. It's not fair and I'm not being loved and all of these things when actually they're avoiding the error-based belief that's within them. Yes. And so they're not actually feeling the causal emotional error. What they are feeling is their rebellion and just 
the rebellion or, against the truth or their justification of the error. That's yes. what they're really feeling. And of course, no change can occur when you do that. We are not, and that's, that's the thing, we are not engaging this principle of absorption when we do that. Correct. It's not about tears, it's about whether we're willing to feel emotionally the errors that are within the soul, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And some of those errors may be rage, and some yes. of them might be shame, and some yeah. of them might be fear, and some of them might, like there's all sorts of emotions which will be attached to belief systems. Yeah. So we might be enraged about the concept of having to be loving even. Yeah. And that is an error that keeps our soul in a place where we're unwilling to be loving no matter how much love we receive. Yeah. And that obviously is going to prevent our soul from progression. Yeah. So, you know, we've got all of these things going on for, mo for most of us and, and we're not honest about it. That, that is the, that, see, this is where truth is so important with the human soul. Without truth, the human soul cannot progress. That's mm -hmm. why it's the truth that sets you free, mm -hmm. because it's the truth that opens your soul to understanding what's in it. Yeah. And it's only by understanding what's in it and releasing what's in it that you can change. So this is where you have to be very honest and truthful about what's really there. Yeah. You know, if you're really angry with your dad, you're really angry with your dad. And it doesn't matter how much you make out you're angry with your dad, you are really angry with your dad. And while that anger exists, there are certain things it's going to preclude yeah. from absorption of truth. Yes. And this is where I see, so this is such a, a big area of self-reflection, self-honesty. Mm. I, you know, I have and I've observed other people they try to engage with this process. So if we think about it in terms of preclusion and absorption, mm -hmm. when we live in facade and in our mind, we can think, oh, I love men. I'm so ready for my soulmate to come along. Yes, we've and heard that many hundreds yes, of times, haven't yes, we? Yes, <laughs> we have. And so the, if, when we're in this state, we think to ourselves, okay, to, en to engage with preclusion, I, then I believe that what's inside of my soul is a lovely feeling towards men and desire for, I desire my soulmate. That's, that's what's really existing in my soul. Yeah. And then um, such a woman might have an interaction with a man and her real emotions towards men are not actually what she thinks, but mm -hmm. she's living in facade in her mind and she believes that. Yeah. And through the interaction with that man, he decides he doesn't want to have a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. And then she thinks, okay, absorption. This is about my daddy not loving me. I need to cry that I'm rejected. And so they, have, they think they're engaging with these processes, but when in reality, if they were to be more honest with themselves, they might find that what is precluding the soulmate relationship, if you like, yeah. or love with their soulmate, is actually a feeling of rage and desire for control and demand, demand upon men. Yeah. And that's the real thing that they need to feel about. Correct. And when they engage the process of absorption, they will begin to feel about those things. Correct. And not their tell life will change. Yes. And this is the thing I feel about absorption. The proof is of whether you've done it is if your life naturally changed without you trying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the proof of if yeah. you've done it. If your life doesn't naturally change without you trying, then it means you haven't done it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you need to go and find another because you're not working on the thing that's actually the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. yeah, this is where I get very passionate about honesty, self-honesty, and yeah. because I know what it's like to live in facade and to live in your mind and tell yourself and try to process yeah. and engage this absorption principle. Yeah. And nothing changes and you just feel demoralised. Yes, and that's good. Because it, it's telling, I agree, it's telling, telling you, you. You should be demoralised, you, you're doing the wrong thing. You haven't yet engaged <laughs> preclusion. Working. You're not even looking at the snapshot that's there at the moment. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so we, that way we get to say, oh, oh, well, the fact that it didn't work means that I did the wrong thing. Yeah. Remember the soul's full proof. Exactly. If we did the right thing, we would have changed. Yeah. If we've done the wrong thing, we're no change. Yeah. If there's no change, we've obviously done the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to feel awesome, like even just connecting to the truth of what's yeah. maybe not awesome, but there is, a, there is a feeling that comes with the recognition of truth. Well, I suppose yeah. you could say the reality is we'll feel pain when the emotional error releases. Mm -hmm. We'll feel pleasure when the emotional truth enters. And, um, and this is the beautiful thing about the way God's designed the soul. 
when emotional truth enters the soul, we feel that pleasure that comes from knowing this truth now. Yeah. And, and when the emotional error releases from the soul, we feel the, the terrible pain associated with that error. Yeah. And that's how it releases, yeah. in fact, by feeling the pain associated with the error. It yeah. releases yeah. the error. And so we can't go through a process without feeling something. And we've got to be aware of that. Yeah. 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 Okay, is there more that you would like to say on the principle? No, I think that's the main thing. I think, uh, I, I think this principle that if there is no change, then it means I haven't found the truth yet yeah. in my soul. Yeah. I might have thought the truth, but I haven't found the truth. I don't know it yet. Yeah. And we've got to stop telling ourselves that we know things that we're yet to change on. You know, we don't know them. We only have heard them. Yep. That's all. Yep. Our memory is recalling them. Yep. We've heard them. Yep. They've gone in our ear and into our memory, but that nothing else has actually happened yet. Yes. And until the soul actually engages this process of absorption, nothing will happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nothing will exactly. happen. And then we can't t five years later go, oh, isn't it terrible? I've been on the divine truth path for five years or whatever. And, you know, I've done this and I've done that and nothing's worked. Well, nothing's worked because you haven't engaged the process yes. from a soul-based perception. You've only heard things. You, you've only mem you know, remembered things that, and regurgitated things you remembered. No real change has occurred in your soul because you're still stopping that from happening. Because if you, were, if, if you were really engaging the change, your soul would have had to release a whole heap of error-based things. You'd be crying here and feeling ashamed about that there and feeling angry about this here and feeling sad about and fearful yeah. about that there. And you'd be going through all this emotional stuff and it will all be related to causal emotion, not to your rebellion and not to your desire to justify your current position. And once that happens real change will occur naturally and you won't even have to try to yeah. change. It will just happen. Yep. It'll just happen around you. It's magical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and if we can remind people of that with this principle, then at least people know when things are not working, there must be something going wrong with their understanding of what is going on inside of themselves. Yeah. 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 And just call people, encourage people towards this true, deep, Honesty with self. Self-reflection. Self that, that's really based on God's truth, not on your own opinion. Yeah. So, that, you know, to actually have self-reflection based on God's truth is very, very different to having self-reflection based on your own opinion. Because yeah. most people who self-reflect based on their own opinion think that everything that they currently think is true. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas once we, start, once we start having some self-reflection about God's position and opinion, now we start to see that many of the things we believe are false, actually. Yeah. And yeah. that's when we have the opportunity to change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, this is uh, part four of our discussion about how the human soul functions. And in this part of the discussion, we're going to talk about the principle of dominance. So over to you, my love. No worries. Well, let's first read the basic principle. The dominance is the principle that... The soul dominates the mind and has full control over the mind, whether the mind believes itself to be in control or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the mind is not capable of ever having full control of the soul, and the soul will always, at some point in our future, exercise its dominance, since that is the purpose of its own creation. Since the soul is emotion, sentiment, desire, passion, longing, aspiration, feeling, sensory, fervour, excitement, and with other similar attributes and characteristics and not dominantly intellectual or mental, and the mind is just one single attribute or organ of the soul, it is impossible for a truth to enter the soul without being accompanied with emotional feelings in addition to logical thought. Mm. In addition, it is also impossible for error to enter or leave the soul without emotional feelings. Yeah. So, again, this feels like we're building on things we've talked about in the previous parts. Yeah. We? We talked about absorption, how error must leave for truth to enter and vice versa, or yeah. it's unlikely that truth would leave. Uh, Sometimes that happens where truth yeah. leaves and error, like you see it happen when people go through traumatic events yeah, that's very and true. they become very angry and, yeah. uh, and upset. And sometimes as a result of that, the truth, the, the, they let go of a truth they've always held on to all their life emotionally and through other emotions entering them, they absorb an error. Yeah. Uh, and that, unfortunately that Sadly. does happen. And, uh, but, but it is 
quite an emotionally tumultuous process, of course, yes. but it does happen. And this is how many people in the human race became in the condition mm. that they currently are through that event happening yeah. through, through, through their life. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. But so this um, dominance is saying to us then from what you've said that the soul is always in charge. It's always the thing that is dominating experience and yeah. uh, thought and all things. But also in there you said that emotional feelings and logical thought always accompany a truth. Correct. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, so what, I, what I'm basically saying in this principle, and remember it's a principle, and that is that the, the soul, if we understand that the soul dominates everything, mm -hmm. then we become more soul-centric rather than intellectual-centric. Yep. And what I mean by that is that we focus more on what's within our soul than thinking things in our mind. Right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're more concerned about what's really going on within our feelings and our emotions and our desires and our passions and our longings. That's what we're concerned with. And you can understand that that's the reason we should be concerned with those things because that's all what is about love. Yeah. So what we love, what are our loves, will determine our actions to a large extent. So if we love doing things that are destructive and evil, then of course our soul will degrade in its condition. If we love doing things that are good and upright, then our soul will grow in its condition. But our soul is always going to control what we eventually do. No matter how much intellectual control we attempt to exercise, our soul will always exercise or attempt to exercise its dominance. Yes. All right. And even with people who are intellectually dominant, the soul is really far more dominant and far more controlling than they realise. Yeah. You know, they often do many things that they look back on and go, why did I do that? I don't believe that. I don't think that. Mm -hmm. But their soul is, is pushing them along a certain direction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is why sometimes people get confused. You know, they, they think they've grown up with a religious faith, for example, all of their life and they believe in love. They believe that love is the, the answer to all things and yet they're unloving. <laughs> and the reason why is because there's emotions in their soul that are exercising dominance all the time, trying to, trying to show them that actually there's a problem in the soul, not in the mind. The mind, you forget about the problem in the mind, the problem's not there. The problem's in the soul, and the soul will do what the soul desires to do unless you work through why it has these desires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the fact. Yeah. So... And you could say the soul then is the true self. Yes. Couldn't yeah. you? The soul is the true self and whatever we think is our true self may or may not be our true self depending on how much we are connected to, to our, soul, our soul, to our yeah. feelings and yeah. our emotions and our desires and our passions. Yeah. That, that is going to be the real self. Yeah. Mm. And something that struck me in uh, feeling about this principle is that, which could be good news or <laughs> depending on... <laughs> <laughs> how you come at it, yeah. is that effort will always be required to suppress the soul. Yes. So um, some of us who don't want to welcome our soul uh, feel that that is a bad thing. I'm always going to have to try. Yes. But actually, if we look at it from God's perspective, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yes. Because the thing that is our true self and the thing that is dictating all of our experiences and creating our attractions, this thing is very hard to dominate. Yes. It, yeah. In fact, it dominates. Yes, God made it that way, like yeah. God made it foolproof. Yeah. God made it that way so that eventually we realise something else is going on here. Yeah. No matter how much I use my intellect, I still can't seem to change in my soul's progression with regard to love. What's yeah. going on? There yeah. must be something in my soul, something in some other location other than my mind yeah. that's causing me to want to take these actions and I need to find it. Yeah. I need to discover it. I need to release it if I'm ever going to become more loving. This is a sad thing as well I feel about the state of the world is that many people have given up on the idea that change is possible. Yes. And many people actually believe, well, a person is the person that they are. From seven years on, that's it. You've, it's done and dusted. And, and for the majority of people, that is true. That's right. That, many people believe that because there's very little engagement with these principles yes. in day-to-day -day life. Yes. Yeah. Most people have no awareness of how the soul can truly change. And as such, many people have a belief that you can't really change. <laughs> you can't really change is yeah. what they believe. They, they, they feel 
that um, any change would have to be forced upon the soul mm. rather than, rather than, and then co of course that's what they attempt to do through their intellect, rather than understanding that it's only because of the error in the soul that needs to be released that no change is happening. Yeah. It's only that that is the true cause of no change. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. So, um, moving on to just some other points that I th thought were relevant. Yeah. Um, that the mind, we've talked a lot about how much we want to use this mind of our spirit body to, to actually to develop that rather mm. than in our soul, mm -hmm. in our other discussions. But in this case, the mind is often used as a tool of denial to suppress the true feelings of the soul rather than a processor and an investigator that can help us to discover the soul and the soul, what the, the soul's dominance is all about. Yeah, yep. about, I think it would have been eight or nine years ago now, I wrote a paper, I suppose you would call it, yep. a letter to some people, about um, using the mind differently. Mm -hmm. And most people really struggle to use their mind differently than what they've been educated to do from their childhood onwards. Yep. So most people have been taught to use their mind as the controller of the soul. Yes. And this is our main problem. We think that it can control the soul, and then we're taught to use our mind to attempt to control the soul. And, and sometimes it's, it's successful for periods of time. Yep. Of course, it's never going to be eternally successful because the soul is always going to exercise dominance. dominance yeah. And so what happens, though, is that we start telling ourselves, well, the proper use of our mind is to control everything. But that's not the proper use of our mind. The proper use of our mind is to seek and discover all emotions inside of our soul and to release those emotions in a way that's loving. Yes. That's the proper use of our mind. Yeah. So in other words, if our soul feels like going out and killing someone, that's a problem. And what we do is we allow ourselves to feel the emotion and feel the reason why it's present. But we use our mind to, t to say, don't you go and do that unloving thing. Mm -hmm. Feel this unloving emotion instead. Yeah. Feel the feeling you feel that you want to do it. And if you truly get to the cause of this feeling, you'll release it. And all of a sudden that feeling will dissipate from you and you will no longer feel that way towards that person. Yes. Yeah. And that's the proper way to use the mind. Yes, to engage the next principle that we'll talk about later, which is about progression. Yeah. Um, but it's a very Christian viewpoint that you highlighted, isn't it, that we must use the mind to control the animal instincts of the person or the original sin that exists within us. Oh, I feel it's in it, most religions, it, not like, just in the Christian yep, faith. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. And yet there is this other great opportunity that we have that you just pointed out to yeah. actually engage our mind to discover yes. and then to heal things yes and that's the only way things can change permanently yes yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel that the majority of people in religious faith don't understand that basic principle yeah. that permanent change is not possible unless you understand the soul is going to try for dominance continuously yeah. and the only way to fix this is to actually release from the soul the error of what it wants to dominate. Yes. You know, the, the area that it wants to take. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, in Bible texts and other Holy Scripture texts, there are thoughts such as the heart is treacherous and who can know it. Mm -hmm. So that's basically telling you not to trust your soul. Yep. And what I'm suggesting is trust your soul's feelings. You don't have to act upon them. Yeah. Right? There's a difference between feeling the soul's feelings and then taking an action upon them. Right. So, so if the feeling of the soul is to go and do something that from God's perspective is obviously unloving, then you would use your mind to help you not take that action, but you would also use your mind to find the reason why you feel that you want to take that action. Yes. And that's where most religious faiths fall down. They don't use their mind to find the reason. Mm -hmm. They only use their mind to control or dominate or attempt to dominate the soul. And of course, it's never successful. Yeah. You know, it, they always finish up reverting that, that behaviour. So, so a lot of men, for example, with regard to their desires for looking at a naked woman's body, they revert to pornography. Then, they, then in the Christian faith, they feel very guilty about the fact that they're looking at pornography. So they feel very like, much like they're sinners and isn't it terrible? 
they're asking for forgiveness. And then the very next week, they want to look at pornography again. Now, why is that? It's because there's something in the soul that needs to change that causes them to desire to look at pornography all the time and not be focused sexually on their own partner if they have one. Yeah. And as a result of that, they, they focus on you know, feeling all bad and guilty and terrible, mm-hmm. but, but not finding the real reason why oh. they feel drawn to pornography. Once you find the real reason why you're drawn to pornography, you won't be drawn to it anymore. Yeah. And yeah. then you won't, you, know, you won't desire to do it. Yeah. And, and so you won't have to try to not look. There will be no desire in you to buy it or to look at it on the internet or any of those things. And then you don't have to feel guilty <laughs> either <laughs> that you've done it because yeah. you no longer do it. And that's the thing, isn't it? Um, this, the error within the soul is going to try to dominate. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's designed to dominate our experience. Yes. But the longer we live in denial or try to deny and we use all this effort and we create fear about even feeling and discovering what's in our soul, mm-hmm. the more it becomes a problem, doesn't it? Yes. And it requires more effort and we have more fear. And, and the actual, the interesting thing that happens is it's a very interesting thing that goes on. We have to use our mind to think about dominating more. Yes. And as a result, we finish up thinking more about the problem, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which actually causes a stronger attraction to the problem. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's quite clever that God made this system that the more you try to dominate your soul with your mind by thinking about the problem and trying to focus on the problem, the more the problem becomes <laughs> yes. evident. Yeah. I just, <laughs> and it's quite, I, yeah. you know, and that... And and the interesting thing is if you focus your attention instead on finding the reason why you feel that way in your soul and you release it, you don't have to think about it at all. And as a result, it is out of your mind and so therefore you're not focused on it anymore and so it doesn't come up. (laughs) I just had a memory of um, an episode of Faulty Towers and for anyone watching, that's like an English comedy show with John Cleese. And they have a German person come into the hotel to stay and he says to all the staff, don't mention the war, don't mention the war. And so obviously he... And all of them want to mention the war And he ends up mentioning the war and references to the war all of the time because he's trying so hard not (laughs) to. Don't mention it, yeah. 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 And that's exactly how we are with the soul. The soul will do what it desires. And unless we look at the reason why, we're never going to get rid of the cause. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what struck me... I mentioned earlier this effort, this terrible effort that we have to put in. Yep. And if we think about that on a global scale, where just about everyone on the earth is trying to suppress and deny what's in their soul, it's like a, a global, like a huge waste of energy to yep. me. It's like Yes, if we had to analyse how much energy the whole human race wastes on trying to change things, that are never going to change unless we look at the real reasons why they're there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. In fact, almost the entire medical profession is focused on changing the effects of things. Yeah. So you look at that entire... That's, that's in, a, in, a, in any country, that's billions and billions and billions of dollars of taxpayers' funds yeah. going towards the wrong use of, the, of our energy. Yeah. We're trying to f- fix the effect rather than fix the cause. And that's because we don't understand dominance. We think that fixing the effect does something, and it doesn't. It just keeps causing the same problem over and over again because we're not focused on the cause. A person who speeds is going to speed until you fix the reason why he speeds. You can make as many laws as you want. You can fine him as much as you want. He'll still speed. He will. You can throw him in jail and the very next day after he gets out, he'll probably speed. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Until you focus on the reason why he does it, you won't change anything. And the same applies to people, you know, with relationships cheating on each other, you know, parents abusing children and all of these other aspects of life that cause us so much trouble. Unless we, find, unless we focus on what is dominant, the soul, and find the reason inside the soul why that happens, no change is really going to occur ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we're going to live it. We'll be like, you know, living the same day over and over and over again. It's like Groundhog, that movie Groundhog yep, yep, Day yep. With, with Bill Murray in it where he's living the same day over and over again, trying a different action without finding a change in his soul. 
And it's only when he changed in his soul that something, something. in his day actually finished yeah. up really changing. Yeah. And that's the same yeah. with us. Like we need to change our souls so that things can really change. Yeah. And until we do that, nothing can change. And globally, man, there's so much wasted money, time, effort going towards trying to fix, provide solutions to fixing the effects rather than understanding why they occur. Which is all about the dominance of what's in the soul. Correct. And I even thought about it just on a person by person scale, the emotional energy, the mind yeah. power that so many of us are using to suppress and deny the dominance of, of the, what's already inside of us. Yes. Imagine if we use that energy in different ways. If we just gave up and surrendered and said, yep. okay, I'm like that. Yep. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> this is me. And I can see there's a lot of bad things here now. Let's try and find the reason why I feel this way. Yeah. That would be a lot better use of our effort than trying to go, no, I'm not like that. No, I'm not yeah. like that. Don't yeah. tell me I'm like that. Don't you, you know, fighting with everybody who tells you you're yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, trying to control the knowledge that we are like what we are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a very important part principle of the of dominance. I feel, and and I feel too that many of us are act actually acting in denial of dominance. Yeah. Because you look at how many people talk about diet and all the time, and you know, you know, taking you know taking this pill, that pill. You know, habits of highly habits successful people. Of highly, you know, yeah, changing our habits and all of these focuses on the physical body. They're all, they're all focused because we don't understand our soul. We don't mm. understand that even how fat our body is, is totally determined by what's going on within our soul. Yeah. And, and that's driving what we eat. Yes. <laughs> you know, if we could change what's in the soul, we wouldn't eat the same things and we wouldn't need to go on diets and we wouldn't, we'd slim up straight away. Yep. You know, it's, it's the same principle with every single walk of life. And so when we are focused on the physical all the time, yep. it is proof that we don't understand dominance. We, yeah. It's proof that we don't understand our soul. If you're focused on a physical cure or physical solution to your problems, it's proof that you're yet to understand this principle. You're yes. yet to understand the principle of dominance. And also, uh, I feel it's because we've been trained away from trusting our feeling state. And so we feel more comfortable with change. We trust more things that f physical things seem more tangible to us even than to our own feelings because we've been so trained away from trusting our feelings as children. Oh, I do say? also, though, feel that a lot of our feelings are not trustworthy <laughs> in the sense that you uh, know, okay. we are often in the superficial part of our feelings rather than in the causal part of our feelings. You know how f we talk to people about there's their true nature and personality, then there's injured nature and personality, and then there's their facade nature and personality. Mm -hmm. And most people live almost totally in their facade nature and personality. That's not their soul. That's the fu fully con functioning of their intellect and all of the soul-based damage that's occurred through the hurt part of the soul. Yes. And, and unless we understand these principles, that unless we get to the soul cause and somehow get that soul cause out of our soul, yeah. every action we take, every physical pill we pop, everything that we do is all going to be based upon trying to address effects rather than causes. Yes. Um, perhaps if you'll permit me to personalise this yeah, yet sure, again. Sure. Um, <laughs> I know for myself, when encountering principles like dominance and progression, as they truly exist, yep. I have wanted to run from this experience of what is truly in my soul mm. because as a child, there, that wasn't rewarded. <laughs> yep. And so there's a feeling of wanting to be able, feeling helpless to change things and then feeling that, well, if I change this effect, if I work with this physical thing in my daily life, I get to avoid even feeling how helpless and hopeless I feel about, about change. And that hopelessness is there because there is such a terror of diving into the emotional state because of some things that are precluding, some fears mm. that make me believe that diving into that feeling state is going to create 
punishment kind of or thing. withdrawal of love or mm -hmm. something terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see that um, I have fought the dominance of, of my soul, if you like, yes. uh, for that reason. Yes, the ma majority of people on the planet are in an active war with their own soul. Yeah. Uh, because they don't, you know, and they're taught to be in this active war from the time of their childhood. Their parents are in a war with their children's soul, generally. So what happens initially when a child is born, the parent starts feeling a lot of the things the child, uh, you know, the child, uh, the parent starts feeling a lot of things it doesn't want the child to be. Yeah. And as a result, the parent starts forcing stuff into the child. And of course, this creates a feeling of acceptance of the parent's dominance. Mm -hmm. And th that, of course, makes the child very, very afraid of being able to feel itself and to feel its true nature and personality. And as a result, most of us, by the time we're in our teenage years, and, and even in our rebellious teenage years, we still only are willing to go a certain that, way yeah. with pushing the boundaries generally, you yeah. know, the average person. Or when we push the boundaries, we're pushing them because we're already angry, yeah. which is not a loving emotion coming from in our soul anyway. So by that time, we've already got a lot of unloving emotions yeah. inside of our soul driving our actions to rebel. And as a result of that, we become so afraid of being our true selves that even when we're alone, we're afraid of being our true selves. It's like the, the, the soul is, is, is so afraid of what the parents might have done mm -hmm. that it now thinks that it will happen to them if they change now as an adult. Yes, and they, they feel that they will experience that even with no one else around, <laughs> that it will yep. be terrible and frightening or, yeah. or whatever. And often as a result, it is terrible and frightening yep. because that is the belief inside of the soul. And that belief was created by the parents who created this particular belief that it's frightening to connect with your true self. You need, yes. to, you need to dominate your true self. You need to push it away. Otherwise, God or us will disapprove. We will yep. disapprove of you. Yep. You know, that's the, that's the implication of most of the parents' actions. And, and if they're of a religious faith, the parents probably inculcated that about God feeling yes. this way towards the child. Yeah. And as a result, the, there's a terrible amount of fear inside of the child towards being itself. Yeah. And that's all because we have tried to suppress the soul's dominance. Yeah. yeah. And I can see that from both perspectives in yeah. terms of the error. So a, a terrible fear of just experiencing the error that is, exists within. Yeah. But also... So the, so the preclusion emotion is the fear. The fear. The fear is precluding us from working through all of that fear, those feelings. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And also I have experienced that and I think a lot of people experience... Or maybe not, I don't know. I can only speak for myself. But in terms of my true nature and personality, which is a part of my soul, which wants to dominate and that will eventually dominate, yeah. scares the crap out of me yes. just being myself and expressing my passions and desires and, and my that's love about of God. the preclusion emotion of not being willing to surrender yes yeah <laughs> does that make sense i know well yeah. so yeah so the preclusion emotion of not being willing to surrender causes us to refuse to surrender to our soul's true nature yeah which is going to dominate eventually anyway sooner or later once we surrender yeah and sooner or later what happens is we've expended so much energy not surrendering fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting most of our life, that eventually we're so exhausted that we surrender. Yes. <laughs> it's far better to surrender much younger, if you can, yeah. rather than surrendering after just a long battle or war with your own soul. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel, why do you feel we resist surrender towards our, the positive aspects of our nature? Because we were taught by our parents and by our environment that those things weren't positive. Mm. You know, it's quite, it's quite plain that yeah. we would, we've been taught those things. So. So again, it's about what is God's truth about the matter? Would God see these things as positive? You know? and, and if our parents believe they are so negative, what's the logical reason why they why believe they it's so negative? Yeah. You know, these are the kind of things we're going to have to resolve in order to eventually allow the soul emotion, which is the preclusion emotion of fear, mm -hmm. to be released. Mm. Once, we, once this preclusion emotion of fear is released, then we are open to absorbing some new truths about ourselves and we're also open to acting in harmony with our soul's dominance. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, and it only ends in more pain trying to, to yeah. suppress the dominance, doesn't it? That's the sad thing, is that the majority of pain on the planet is, is caused by the, by the suppression of the soul's dominance. If, if the average person allowed their soul to dominate, they wouldn't be able to go to war, they wouldn't be able to take unloving actions towards their partners or friends, they would feel terribly guilty if they did, mm. uh, but, but, but they wouldn't even take those actions because the soul would have released the emotion as to what causes them to take those actions. And, and so, you know, unless we understand dominance and actually live our life in harmony with it, and this requires some courage, mm. because it, not only do we have to have the courage to release the reasons, the negative emotions, you know, the fear-based emotions as to why we're not allowing our soul to dominate, we have to have the courage to allow our soul to dominate even if in the future other people may attack us for such, for such allowance, you know. Yeah. If, if, there's all sorts of people up there who want to suppress you. There's all sorts of people who want you to be a different person than you really are. God's not like that. God wants you to be who you truly are, not what your errors dictate you are, but rather who you truly are. And that means you discovering your true nature and personality and having the courage to live it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see a lot of people struggling. They, they discover some parts of their true nature but they don't let themselves have the courage to live, to it. live it. They don't allow themselves to go through the fears that cause them to not be able to live it. Yeah. And so preclusion precludes them from being their true self. And that's pretty sad. It is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Imagine a world where kids are, are taught from a little, from when they're born, that the soul has dominance and that this can be very empowering and they can learn so much by allowing the soul to dominate. Yeah, and that they're pure personality is something to be honoured and treasured, and treasured and, yeah. not something to be broken and, and pushed Con into a mould. Made into conform yeah. to a certain set of standards. Yeah. yeah, And, you know, a lot of people on this planet believe that conformity is the only way to engage law. Yeah. And that is so wrong. Law of love does not demand conformity. It demands love. Yes. Love is the way to have a peaceful environment, not conformity. Mm. Yeah, so this is something that we still need to learn on the planet, that it's only love that can actually develop true peace. Yeah. Conformity doesn't develop peace, and we have a lot of evidence of that, both in our personal societies in each individual country, but also in the world as a whole. We can see that many times we conform, we compromise, but it doesn't create peace. It doesn't create peace at all. When we love, it creates peace. That's the only thing that's going to create peace. Yeah. And, and love comes from the soul. So the soul is going to have to change yeah. and, and be dominant in order to love. Yeah. 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 So perhaps we should wrap up our discussion of domin dominance sure. there because the next discussion is about progression, which yes. is all about how we can do that. And how we can engage all of the principles so far so that far. we've learnt. Yeah. 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 So we're continuing our discussion of how the human soul functions and we are up to the principle of progression. So I'm with Jesus and we're going to discuss and have some questions about the principle of progression. G'day. So again, shall I read the general principle? Yes, please. Progression is the principle that true progression within the soul can only be obtained through an emotional process that will involve both pain associated with emotions related to error and pleasure associated with emotions related to truth. If the soul denies either pain or pleasure or uses its mind to deny pain or pleasure, progression cannot occur. One immediate and permanent characteristic or indication that truth has entered the soul is that it must have been an emotional process. <laughs> it, is also, it also fundamentally suggests that one characteristic of the release or acceptance of error in the soul is that it also must be an emotional process. So in other words, truth being accepted is an emotional process and error being released is an emotional process. You can't intellectualise yourself out of a belief. Yeah. <laughs> At all, ever, never, ever. <laughs> <laughs> and progress is always, always, always emotional. Yes. And there is no other way to progress. No. 
Otherwise, we're still with the dominance of what's already existing within the soul. Correct. Because the only way for things to leave the soul is through, through this emotional process. process. Yep. Yes. And it's such an important truth to understand, I feel, yeah. Yeah. that still most of the people who have been listening for five or six years have still not got much understanding of mm -hmm. this, pro this process that, you know, we need to understand that we need to allow pain and pleasure. You know, on the planet today, the majority of people are so addicted to pleasure that they cannot allow any pain. Mm -hmm. And, that, and the problem with that is, is the soul is often full of pain from our childhoods, from our environment, and we don't allow the expression of it. So what happens is the pain levels inside of our soul build up, yeah. build up, build up, build up. They reach traumatic levels mm -hmm. because we don't ever allow their release. Yeah. And as a result, they, our whole life becomes quite traumatic many times mm. because we're not allowing the release of these painful emotions because we're addicted to the concept that we shouldn't have to feel yeah. them. But they are inside of us and only we can feel them. And, and this is a problem that I see most people face. Yeah. That, that they don't understand that unless you allow these painful emotions to be experienced, which means going through some painful feelings, you are not going to progress. Yeah. No, no real progress can occur. Yeah. And, and, and you can tell yourself, you know, there's even people now channeling differently or telling you, yeah, every time I teach this concept, people are so challenged that they want to run off to a spirit who tells them something different, you know, and, and they don't understand that this is the only way you can truly progress yeah. Yeah. is by allowing yourself to feel both your painful and pleasurable emotions. And I don't know how you can say it more, baby, <laughs> say it more clearly or more yeah. definitely. I do know that there comes a point in your progression where you, it's at the start of your progression, really, where you realise emotionally the truth of what you've just stated. Yes. Where you say... Where you give up trying it for it to be something different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you give up just holding in your back of your mind hopefully maybe it could have been i it's still something isn't it that intellectual maybe there's shift a different I made. way yeah. there's yeah. A, there surely has to be a different yeah. way is yeah. what we're constantly focused and on stop looking for proof of other it, there comes a point where you emotionally realize you're emotional when you do realize it where you yeah. emotionally realize wow unless i'm emotional unless emotion is flowing from me yeah. nothing no. will change permanently in my life that's right yeah yeah and it's such a critical point in a person's progression for that realisation to actually occur. And so many people arrogantly assume that that's not the case. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much you talk to them about it. And, and in fact, most of the people who are not progressing, it doesn't matter how much I've said that to them, they still do not believe it. Mm. And this is why we've recently began some discussions about, you know, so it's 2000, it was April 2014 for anybody <laughs> listening to this at the moment. We've recently begun some discussions about emotion and the importance of emotion and the importance of feeling emotion. Because without, without people truly getting that principle, yeah. no change is possible. And, you know, love is an emotion. Like, no matter what anybody tells you, it's an emotion. It's not a thought. It's an emotion. It's a feeling within you that drives your actions. When you love something, you, you aren't backward in coming forward when you love something. When you truly love, it drives you into action. Mm -hmm. So love's this beautiful, motivating emotion. And, and any changes in our love state are going to have to be emotional. They're going to have to be because love itself is an emotion. And we're not going to change if we try to convince ourselves differently. Now, I've, I've talked about that for years and years now. And the average person coming to the seminar still does not believe that. Mm. They still believe that they can intellectually adjust their life, intellectually adjust their health, intellectually adjust their relationships and so forth without having to feel an emotion mm. about it. And in particular, without having to feel a painful emotion. Yeah. We are so addicted to only having pleasurable emotions that we are scared, at, we're, we're petrified yeah. of pain. Yeah. And, and 
the problem with a person who's petrified of pain is they'll do anything, including causing the pain, pain to others, to prevent their own pain. Yeah. And this is a very sad state of affairs. When we, will, where, when we are willing to do anything to prevent our own pain, we are willing to go to war. We are willing to rape, murder, pillage. We are willing to lie, steal, cheat. We're willing to do anything in that state to prevent the experience of our own pain. And that is a very dangerous state, actually. And it's one of the main dangers on this planet. The level of violence that appears on this planet is almost all directly the result of a person's individual desire to avoid their own pain. Yeah. And it's just such a sad state of affairs. We need to learn how to cope with and feel pain without acting upon it. Yeah. And this and is very important. That's, that's what happens often, is it, isn't it, that pain is triggered? Or even, sadly, in the West, we are so accustomed now to meeting our addictions and getting what we want. We're even, we're even uncomfortable with a little bit of discomfort. Like, if yeah, there's a break in routine, bit of discomfort we don't and get what we rage. want. And yeah. there's, there's, there's rage and rebellion about even just experiencing that. Yeah. And, but really what you're saying is in order for, for us to change and grow and for the world to change for the better, we must all learn to allow the overwhelm of our pain Yes. rather than have it triggered and try to pain. prevent it. The full experience it. of it. Yep. Yes. Yep. And for most people that's going to feel very overwhelming because they've never done that yes. in their entire yep. life. Yep. Yep. And yep. so, for, of course, it's going to be overwhelming initially. Yep. But, it, but this is how the soul grows. It has to be overwhelmed in order to grow. Yeah. So you can't grow without being overwhelmed by emotion of some kind, whether yep. it's pleasure or pain. And let's face it, a lot of us are frightened of also being overwhelmed by pleasure. Of course. There's a lot of other fears that can be triggered in that process. Yes. That, unless we're humble to them... That doesn't happen either. Correct. So we've got this double whammy, if you like, where we're, where, we're, where we're constructing our life. We're so afraid of being overwhelmed by pain. And at the same time, we're seeking pleasure, but not too much, not too much. Yep. <laughs> you know, we're trying to control like how much. <laughs> this, there's, a, there's a zone of comfort. Yes. And anything outside on either end yes. is challenging emotionally. Yes. And so we avoid that and actually justify, as you said earlier, pretty harsh behaviour. Yes. Um, right down to killing people. You yeah. know, how many mothers are willing to kill their own unborn ch child just because they yeah. might experience a bit of pain by having a, having a having in childbirth and having to look after the child? Yeah. That, that, you know, that happens, well, it's documented happening 50 million times every year, mm. where 50 million people feel like that every year. Like, and that's not including the fathers who encourage such things. Mm -hmm. you know, so this is an indication that we are so, we are so focused on avoiding pain that we're willing to kill children in order to avoid pain. Yeah. That, that's how bad this problem is on the planet. Mm. And we need to change this. Like, and the way you can change this is by teaching children how to feel their own pain without acting upon it. Yeah. And if we had programs in schools that did that, that actually taught children how to feel their own pain without acting upon their pain, yeah. by the time they're five or six years of age, they wouldn't have any pain. Yeah, <laughs> it would be so awesome. <laughs> they'd, they'd be free of pain. Yeah. And that only experience pleasure. Yeah. But because we are so focused on suppressing pain, even in the child, by the time the children are in their teenage years, they're now creating havoc and pain for other people generally. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and, and the amount of things that we're prepared to do avoid, to avoid pain is very intense. Yeah. It is the major cause of all violence on the planet. It's the major cause of all murders on the planet, all... all uh, um, all um, abortions on the planet and so forth are all caused by this desire to avoid personal pain. Yeah. You know, and it's such a terrible state of affairs. And, and it will not change unless we start seeing that, that true progression can only occur by us allowing the feeling of pain. Yeah. It's so simple. It's such, it's such an answer. If everyone on the planet just did that one thing... Yep. The planet would change overnight. Correct. There would be no war. No. Because there'd be no one who felt painful enough. Who wanted, who to, wanted avoid to suppress pain their enough. painful yeah. enough to go to war. Yeah. Yeah. There'd be no war. Yeah. You know, there'd be and no rapes. There'd be no man who feels enough pain to actually con contemplate sexually violating a woman. There'd be no rapes. Yeah. 
because he, he's willing to go through his emotions about that, how, how his feelings about that, how he's treated as a child from his own mother, perhaps, or whatever. He's, a, he's allowing himself to go through those things rather than actually take that out on another woman. Yeah, yeah. You know, there'd be no violence. You know, if somebody insults you, you'd feel your pain about it. Yeah. Instead of punching them back. Yeah. You know, yeah. Someone, someone violently assaults you, you'd feel your own pain about it without wanting to kill them. And, and if everyone engaged that process with God, truth would begin entering people everywhere. 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 And so joy would be multiplied exponentially. Everywhere. Because that, that always <laughs> happens when truth is absorbed, there's Correct. joy. But also things would be more in harmony with logic, as we've talked about earlier yes. in this discussion. Laws with, would change overnight because yeah. everybody would now disagree that that law applies anymore. You <laughs> wouldn't even have to change the law in a court. You'd no. just... There'd be a new law because everyone would be acting in that law. <laughs> exactly. And the other one would be redundant. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of laws would become redundant yeah. as a result of everyone feeling their own pain rather than acting upon it. Yeah. And, you know, it's such an important message of, pro mm. of progression and the majority of people still have no real understanding of how much change will result once they actually embrace it inside of their soul. Yeah. Both to themselves personally but also, uh, but also to... So not only to themselves personally, but also to their family, their friends, the society in which they live, their work environment, every, everything around them, the environment itself will change as a result of them choosing differently. Yeah, and I often see um, people around us who are trying to analyse their progress. Oh, I cried about this. I think it was about that. I think that's going to change this. Or I've got to, I'm doing this, so I've got to figure out. And that, you know, it's very um, analytical and intellectual. Yep. When if we just trusted these principles and just said, well, if I'm willing to be honest and self-reflective and feel what's really there and understand the principle that progression is going to happen if I simply allow the emotion that is there, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have to put any effort into anal analysing. No. We would just feel and truth would enter us. Yeah. And it's only the belief in error that creates our pain anyway. Yes. And so there couldn't be more pain. And so it simplifies it's so simple. everything. Yep. You don't have to think so much. Yep. You can, you're just focused finding the error, letting it go. Finding the error, you know there's pain there, yep. let the pain go, feel yep. it. Yep. The only way you're going to let it go is by feeling it. And you're focused on that. You use your mind to find the pain yep. and to feel it yep. instead of using your mind to try to run away from it yep. try, and try to do all the other things we do trying to get away from that pain. It's, if you really understood progression, you would never avoid a single pain that you had again. No. You'd never avoid it. And sadly, a lot of us have a lot of false beliefs about what's going to happen to us when we feel our pain. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, when we progress, when we really progress using this principle and feeling our emotion, our, we have more clarity and more joy in our life regardless even of what happens around us. Mm -hmm. Even if more figure, fear gets exposed, even if more emotions get exposed, there is still more joy and quality of life yes. within us. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, with, within us and in our yes. relationship with God. And so, for, so this is the unfortunate fact. The majority of people feel that it's dangerous to feel their own pain. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it's dangerous not to. Yeah. It's dangerous not to feel your own pain. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to be better if you feel your pain than not. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel a lot of people's false beliefs get really tied up in the whole thing, don't they? Where they believe that oh, oh, if I feel pain, my life's going to get worse. And, as, and they often believe that, of course. And that prevents them from feeling their pain, which means their life does get worse, mm. ironically. Mm. And I find that so unfortunate watching people do all of this when, when it's quite simple. If you allow yourself to truly experience your own pain and release it, it will release by you feeling it. Once that happens, change is automatic after that. You don't have to try. And on top of that, you experience the joy of relief yeah. of it at all being released. And then, but, but in addition, that is the safest place you could be. Yeah. And there's so much focus, I find, on how dangerous it is to, to feel your emotions. Man, the amount of times the media in Australia and overseas has criticised me for teaching this teaching. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible yeah. how much and there, investment there is in trying to have people not feel their pain. 
isn't it's that like, like crazy? Incredible. You don't see them knocking on doors of like funeral parlours and bursting in and saying to people, don't feel stop your pain. crying, <laughs> stop crying, that's dangerous. Yeah. When in fact, it's we're really just encouraging people to do the same thing. Every time you suppressed a loss or a feeling of fear or a feeling of grief in your past, simply allow that process now. Correct. And it's only the false beliefs we have about that process that actually put us in any danger. Yes. And there are an immense amount of spirits around us who do not want us to feel our pain because it's through our pain that they meet their own addictions. Or through our avoidance <laughs> of pain. Yes. yes. Through, through our avoidance of trying to get away from our pain, they meet their addictions. So they are heavily invested in telling us that we shouldn't have to feel our pain. Mm -hmm. right? and, and the world as well is heavily invested in telling us we shouldn't have to feel our pain. And why is that? Because they want to sell us something. They want to sell us and uh, you know, uh, some kind of product that helps us avoid our pain. Yeah. That's why they're heavily invested in it. And until the world gets away from this investment in helping people avoid pain and instead makes products and, in, <laughs> and, so, and services that helps you get into your pain in a loving way and th that, that is not harmful, then we're not going to have much change on the planet, to be right. honest. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You can tell we're a bit passionate about this point. <laughs> Honestly, it's one of the biggest problems that we face in the, in the teachings of divine truth yeah. because people think that they can absorb new truth without getting rid of the old painful error, and they can't. Mm -mm. Like, so you, I can speak truth all day, every day, and we can have like 100 hours of videos every week talking about new truth, and the majority of people are not going to be able to have it absorbed into their soul because they're unwilling to feel the pain of their error. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like knocking on a brick wall, yeah. you know, until, until there's an opening in the soul towards pain, which is like a door in the brick wall, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. And the, the world will not accept truth while it is so opposed to feeling pain. Yeah. Because yeah. all of the error that's in, within the soul is all painful. It's going to have to come out and it's going to have to come out by experiencing it. And there is no other option. Yeah. <laughs> there's no other option. Yeah. There's no other fancy way. There's no tapping. There's no this. There's no that. There's no Reiki. There's no, none <laughs> of those things will cause you to actually get into all of your causal grief and pain. You have to go through it. And, and when you allow yourself to go through it, God's love can come and just make it just wash away so simply and easily. And this is the sad thing because we're so unwilling to feel the pain doesn't give us the opportunity to feel much of God's love either. And we, yeah, sad. and we know from the other principles, like dominance, uh, we know that all of our belief systems, all of our thoughts, all of our actions, everything is going to be based on what is already in our soul. Correct. And so it doesn't matter if you try to find the causal belief and modify <laughs> that and, you know, ask God to please, you know, take it away. Unless we deal with the causal emotion that has driven that belief. And unless we're willing to feel it and yes, experience it. Yes. Unless it's gone from us in an emotional process, it's going to dominate our life. Correct. Yeah. 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 And I feel that this is one of the major things people need to understand about their progression. Mm -hmm. These are the principles of progression that are so, so important for a person to understand. And if they understand this, they understand the soul. And, these are, and this kind of understanding of the soul is everlasting. Like yeah. This is how the soul progresses. So once you've released all your pain, the only emotions you experience after that are pleasure. Yeah. So, so it's going to be very easy to learn once all the emotions are just pleasurable without learning, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But, but if you're unwilling to feel the pain, none of that can actually ever happen. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. The world is in so much pain and individuals in the world are in so much pain that, that we never engage the process of the feeling of the pain. And then as a result, the truth, the pleasure of receiving the truth cannot happen for us. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's also a sad thing. So God's trying to share all this truth, all this wealth of, of ex emotional experience and truth that God has for us to experience. We can't experience any of it when we're so resistive to our pain. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're really using our will to lock up the progress of our soul. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're, the only way our soul is going to progress is by our heavily being heavily engaged in a slow and very, very painful process of slowly changing each emotion that we're unwilling to feel completely because we're unwilling to cope with being overwhelmed with pain. Yeah. And 
And as a result, we feel a smidge of it, feel a smidge of it, smell a smidge of it. We make a little bit of progress because we feel a smidge of it each time. But it takes hundreds, if not thousands of years for people to do that kind of progression. When your progression can be right down 10 years or, or mm -hmm. 15, 20 years, you know, even on earth it can be 15, 20 years of progression and you're at one with God and without pain. Yeah. Um, so why would you avoid that progress when, process when doing it the other way can take thousands of years? Yeah. So it just makes no sense at all to mm. me. And this is something we observed a lot from the spirit world, obviously. You know, people making these choices to avoid pain, avoid pain, avoid pain. And hopefully one of the things we're trying to show people is, like, we've been through a lot of personal pain. And, and we've still got more personal pain to go through. And each time we do, we end up feeling happier. Yeah. And that is a demonstration of the truth of what we teach. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Talon, for no discussing worries. this with me. And so I suppose that is the finish of our session today in mm -hmm. the sense of our session with regard to feeling, uh, fe feeling these uh, points about the human soul. We've still got three more um, points to discuss about this, so we'll do that in our next session yep. on the human soul, which we hope will be probably next week. But yep. thanks for your time yep. uh, in terms of what you today. We hope you it. enjoyed it. And thanks again for Igor behind our main camera there and, and Lena behind the other camera. And for recording our sessions today for us. Thanks, guys. <laughs>